Right. Claudia, do you want to kick us off? Hi, Joan. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, I want to introduce uh, Marta Buckley from George Mason University, and she's going to talk about AMOC and SST. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia, and thanks for uh, the invitation to speak. And um, I'm sorry I'm not there with all of you guys in person. Um, all right, can you guys see my screen? I can. Okay, perfect. Yep, good on this end. Okay, okay so um, Today, I'm going to talk about the role of the AMOC in ocean heat transport and the implications for subpolar SST variations. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some collaborators from this for this work, uh, Tim DeSole and Lori Chenery from George Mason, Laura Zana from NYU, and Sarah Larson and Kay Monago from North Carolina State. Um, so just uh, as a note, I'm supposedly talking about um, task team four, which is, or task team two, which is very broad. Um, it's called AMOC State Variability and Change. Um, I'd like to point out that, um, well, I can't cover all of that in, in my talk, so I chose to narrow my focus. Um, there's an excellent review paper by Jackson et al. 2021, which is called The Evolution of the North Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation Since 1980 uh, in Nature Reviews of the Earth and Environment. And I encourage folks who haven't seen that already to, to check it out. So first I'd like to discuss a little bit about why there's a deep overturning circulation in the Atlantic at all. Um, these figures are from an excellent review paper on the topic of contrasting the Pacific and the Atlantic overturning circulation by Paula Chessy in 2019. So the sea surface salinity is higher in the North Atlantic than the North Pacific. And um, the reasons for this are described in a, also an excellent review paper by David Farrow in 2018. And so, um, therefore, wintertime cooling creates very dense waters in the North Atlantic. So the North Atlantic is shown on this panel in the, on the left. Um, and there is deep convection, and you can see this from these very strongly sloped isopycnals. And there's dense water formation. Um, additionally, uh, the North Atlantic has shared isopycnal outcrops with the Southern Ocean. And that allows a circulation to be an adiabatic circulation to be sustained in which um, dense waters are upload welled adiabatically driven by the winds over the Southern Ocean. So the plot on the right is just the Indo-Pacific um, temperature, or this is potential density distribution. And um, one can see that it's quite different. Um, the surface waters are less dense. Um, the isopycnal outcrops are much shallower, and there are not shared isopycnal outcrops between the um, North Pacific and the Southern Ocean. No, can you uh, see my mouse? Maybe not. It's okay. Yeah, we can see your mouse. Okay, you can. Perfect. Okay, so now I'm going to show um, the overturning circulation in the Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific. Um, We'll start with the Indo-Pacific, which is shown on the right. Um, this is the overturning in density coordinates. And so any circulation that um, moves northward um, at one uh, density and southward at another density will project onto this overturning in density coordinates. So you can see in the Indo-Pacific, the circulation is dominated by uh, two thermocline cells, which are basically um, symmetric about the equator. So these thermocline cells uh, transport surface waters northward and um, deeper waters uh, back southward. Um, in contrast, in the Atlantic, the circulation looks very different. So you can see um, at, at, near, uh, at the low densities near the surface, there, there is a hint of these wind-driven circulations. But um, the main circulation is a circulation that spans both um, light near surface waters, light thermocline waters up here, and uh, dense uh, mid-depth waters shown down here. So how does the circulation go? So um, we're going to start sort of near the equator. So there's, uh, as you go northward, there's cooling or um, waters become more dense. Then um, dense water formation of North Atlantic deep water in the subpolar North Atlantic creates very uh, dense waters shown down here. And then these uh, waters um, sink and they move southward, um, shown on this branch, 
basically adiabatically at depth. And then these, these um, waters are returned to the surface, um, mostly due to adiabatic upwelling over the Southern Ocean. Um, there is also a uh, abyssal cell, which is most uh, prevalent in the Pacific, shown down here in blue. Um, this is related to Antarctic water bottom water formation. It goes in the opposite direction. So the AMOC is a clockwise cell. This is a counterclockwise cell. And um, it um, does not transport a lot of heat. It's usually referred to as the abyssal cell. And um, I'm not going to discuss it any further uh, here. So due to, um, so the, the Pacific transports heat northward in both hemispheres, that's shown by this green line. Basically, um, that's due to the gyres and the subtropical overturning circulations, and, you know, it's transporting heat from warm to cold, as you might expect. In contrast, the Atlantic um, transports heat northward in both hemispheres due to this deep overturning circulation. Well, actually, Tom Rossby says we should refer to as mid-depth. So I, I'm trying to do that, but sometimes failing. So, um, but, but interestingly, it's not exactly easy to, to determine how much of the ocean heat transport in the Atlantic is due to the AMOC. By that, I mean what portion of the ocean heat transport is due to the fact that there is a deep overturning, uh, well, a surface to mid-depth overturning circulation in the Atlantic. So one way to get about uh, at ocean heat transport is to look at overturning stream functions in temperature coordinates. So um, this control run shows um, so this um, this is this uh, plot on the left shows the overturning stream function in temperature coordinates from a, a climate from a model, a very a fairly coarse resolution model that's described in Ferrara. Ferrari and Ferrara 2011. And you can see, again, basically the circulation looks very similar to what it did in density coordinates, that in the Atlantic, there's a circulation that spans the warm thermoclined waters and the cold mid-depth waters. Um, and so you can relate this um, overturning func stream function in temperature coordinates to the ocean heat transport very easily. And that's done by this equation. So the heat transport can be written as a volume stream function um, over um, temperature differences, or more generally noting this rho naught CP um, factor, it can be written as a mass uh, stream function in um, energy coordinates. So you can approximate the ocean heat transport simply as um, the strength of this circulation, psi m, um, times the temperature over which it acts. Okay. So if you say that the maximum is about 15 square drops as seen here, it operates over a temperature contrast of 15 degrees Celsius that gives you a heat transport of about, the, the peak heat transport of about 0.9 petawatts, which is sort of in accord with um, what, what the actual ocean heat transport is from um, when they calculate it from the model. Um, and so what this figure shows is that, as we can kind of see by looking at the overturning in temperature coordinates, this, this is the ocean heat transport, the total ocean heat transport in the Atlantic um, is shown by the um, black line. And basically all of this can be attributed to this, what they call them, they, they denote it as the mixed circulation. So a circulation that spans both warm thermocline waters and cold mid-depth waters. Um, the contributions of just shallow and deep circulations to the ocean heat transport are basically negligible, and those are shown down here. Okay, so in order to ask the question, how much does this deep overturning circulation, or the surface to mid depth overturning circulation contribute to the ocean heat transport? One way you can do this is do a water hosing experiment to shut off deep convection in the North Atlantic, and then um, that the result of that water hosing experiment is shown here. It's called the no convection experiment. And again, we see the overturning stream function in that experiment. And what you see is that um, it, it looks like a, a much lower amplitude version of the Pacific. So there's basically just the wind driven overturning cells, which are symmetric about the equator. So you have um, northward transport at warm temperatures and um, southward transport 
sorry, pole would transport at warm temperatures and equator would transport at cold temperatures. Um, and uh, here's the ocean heat transport um, in that experiment. And you can see that it's basically um, anti-symmetric about the equator, um, just like the um, transport in the Pacific is. Okay. So this circulation spanning both the warm um, thermocline temperature classes and the cold mid depth temperature classes has been shut down. Um, and so if we just compare the peak ocean heat transport between these two simulations, the top one is the, the um, regular, the control simulation, um, which has the deep overturning in, or the surface to mid depth overturning in the Atlantic. And the um, one on the bottom is the perturbation experiment. So the peak ocean heat transport decreases from 0.8 water pe petawatts to 0.3 petawatts. So that implies that about 60% of the ocean heat transport in the Atlantic um, can be attributed to the shallow to mid, sh thermocline to mid depth circulation. Okay, so just a little summary of this. Um, the Atlantic Ocean heat transport is dominated by a circulation that spans warm thermocline waters and cold mid-depth waters. About 60% of the peak ocean heat transport can be ascribed to this circulation. Um, just as a note, um, Tally did an observational um, analysis of water mass decomposition to estimate the role of North Atlantic deep water in the Atlantic Ocean heat transport from observations. And she also found that about 60% uh, of the Atlantic Ocean heat transport is due to North Atlantic, um, the 60% of the peak is due to North Atlantic deep water transport. All right. And the mean AMOC is sensitive to both um, basically surface densities in the presence of convection and um, the winds over the Southern Ocean. So um, those two, the, wind, the mechanical forcing and uh, the buoyancy forcing aspects of the mean AMOC and the ocean heat transport cannot be separated. Okay, but what about variations of the AMOC and the ocean heat transport? So um, it's, it's possible that temporal variations of the AMOC due to winds forcing and buoyancy forcing are distinct and can be considered separately. And there's some evidence for modeling studies that this is the case. For example, Yeager and Dana Basquiat 2014 showed that heat fluxes applied only over the Labrador Sea explain most of the decadal variability of the AMOC and ocean ice hindcast version of CSM. Also in a series of paper, Tom Delworth and colleagues showed that AMOC variability is the response of the ocean to heat flux variations associated with the North Atlantic Oscillation. Okay, so this gives us motivation to consider separately the effects of time variable wind and buoyancy forcing on the AMOC. And this is work by Sarah Larson at North Carolina State and her postdoc, Kay McMongo. Okay, so what they did is they separated the effects of time variable wind and buoyancy forcing in a coupled model framework, um, CSM2. Okay. So first, let's look at the fully coupled model. So in the fully coupled model, the atmosphere, CAM6 in this case, interacts with the ocean both um, through thermodynamics, buoyancy forcing, shown here, and wind stress. And here, um, we just have separated the time mean with overbars and the time variable um, with primes. And the reason for that will be clear when we look at the mechanically decoupled model. So in the mechanically decoupled model, the atmosphere interacts that we have not changed the thermodynamic interactions at all with the, the atmosphere interaction with the ocean, but um, the ocean only feels the time mean wind stress from the atmosphere in this model. So wind stress variations do not impact um, the ocean in this model. Okay, so just because the mean um, forcing of the ocean circulation is basically the same, um, the mean climate is quite similar in these two simulations. And here I have shown the mean Atlantic Ocean heat transport in the two cases, the fully coupled in black and the mechanically decoupled in blue, and they're very similar. Okay, now what about the ocean heat transport, Atlantic Ocean heat transport variations. Well, there's a very strong role for wind forcing in these variations. So um, the here I have showed the annual variance of the Atlantic Ocean heat transport in the fully coupled model, which is in black, and the mechanically decoupled model, which is in blue. So we call that the fully coupled model, um, the ocean feels both the wind stress forcing, the mechanical forcing, and the air-sea heat fluxes, the buoyancy forcing. 
And in the mechanically decoupled model, the, the ocean only feels the buoyancy forcing, the, the time variable buoyancy forcing. So the difference between the black curve and the blue curve is the impact of time variable winds on the ocean circulation. So you can see that in the tropics and the subtropics, most of the variance in the ocean heat transport is related to wind-driven variations. Um, this part about even at low frequencies is incorrect. I don't know why I wrote that. Um, now, in the subpolar North Atlantic, you can see the blue curve gets very close to the black curve, meaning that a large portion of the um, Atlantic Ocean heat transport variations in the subpolar North Atlantic are due to buoyancy forcing. Now, if we low pass filter, which is shown um, by the gray for the fully coupled and the cyan for the mechanically decoupled, a lot the, the very large variance of ocean heat transport in the fully coupled model goes down substantially and it becomes more comparable to the buoyancy forced. Um, the mechanically decoupled model. So what that means is that um, a lot of these wind driven variations are um, at high frequency, these wind driven ocean heat transport variations. Okay, so the, the winds also disrupt the meridional. So the, the winds are basically adding a lot of high frequency noise and this disrupts the meridional correlation of the AMO strength. So what I've done here is I just took the AMOX strength. Unfortunately, this is in depth coordinates. It would be better if I did this with the ocean heat transport or the um, AMOX strength and density coordinates. Um, well, actually, K did this work, but um, anyway, it's a work in progress to do to to do that um, in in a more appropriate coordinate system. But in any case, this is the AMOX strength um, at every latitude correlated with every other latitude. So what you can see is in the mechanically decoupled model, um, there's very high meridional correlation of the AMOC. And in the fully coupled model, um, which in also includes the wind-driven AMOC variations, this meridional co coherence is decreased substantially. Um, this agrees with prior results of Bonin et al. and Biostek et al., um, which were done in an ocean-only framework. Now, finally, I would like to point out that um, the, the characteristics of AMOC variability and the relative roles of wind and buoyancy forcing bo varies both regionally and with time scale. Okay. So first, let's look in the subtropics. So, um, the, the top, so these are the contour spectra of the AMOC strength um, as a function of period or frequency on the x-axis and latitude on the y-axis. So first, um, if you look at the blue boxes, this is sort of the, the tropics and the subtropics. And you can see um, the fully coupled model results are shown in the top and the mechanically decoupled model results are shown in the bottom. So what you can see is that this very high variance of the AMOC on sort of interannual um, time scales um, is seen in the fully coupled model, but it's absent in the mechanically decoupled model so that means that we can ascribe um, those AMOC variations to wind forcing. In, in the subpolar gyre, um, you can see that um, there's high variance of uh, the AMOC um, on a wide range of time scales in both the fully coupled model and the mechanically decoupled model. So that means both wind and buoyancy forcing play a role in the subpolar North Atlantic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so the, the reason why, you know, wind forcing also plays a role is because you can see that, um, the fully coupled model, uh, has somewhat higher amplitude of AMOC variance in, the in the sub, subpolar gyre, especially on the, um, higher frequencies. All right. Now, what the thing that I find most interesting about this plot is, okay, so if we look now, um, is there any low frequency variance in the tropics and subtropics. What you find is there's more low frequency AMOC variants in the um, mechanically decoupled model than in the fully coupled model. So this means that you know it's these low frequency buoyancy forced AMOC anomalies that are communicated southward to the tropics and subtropics. And actually the wind forcing disrupts this um, 
this low frequency signal. Um, and so, you know, this is in, it's in accord with some of the prior studies, um, the modeling studies that suggested that these low frequency AMOC, low frequency, but only coherent or latitudinally coherent um, AMOC variability is really due to the buoyancy forcing. Okay. Now, I, I'd also like to point out here that, you know, um, this is kind of, so there, there was a tendency at some point to say, oh, well, the vertical circulation is due to, um, buoyancy forcing and um, the horizontal circulation is due to winds. And we've sort of moved away from that, which is good by, by looking at the AMOC in density or temperature coordinates. But it's good to remember that um, you can't ascribe the um, horizontal circulation is not purely due to wind forcing either. So what we have here is we have the Bears Tropic Stream Function variance, um, the annual Bears Tropic Stream Function variance. And the fully coupled model is shown on the left and the mechanically decoupled model is shown on the right. And so what you see is that in um, the subtropics and tropics, the bare tropic stream function is pretty much all due to um, the, the wind forcing, right? So it's absent in the mechanically decoupled model. But in the subpolar gyre, um, buoyancy forcing also uh, plays a role in the bare tropic stream function. And um, this is in accord with the, the results of Yeager 2015 that shows that bottom pressure torques couple the horizontal um, gyre and overturning circulations. Okay, so um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this little bit of summary um, because I think I said it already. So now I want to get to the oh, three minutes. Okay. What I want to ask is whether subpolar Atlantic SST variations are related to the AMOC. And so um, there's a really fascinated range of subpolar SST variations from both um, the interannual bits, uh, this cold blob, to the centennial trend, which Lei Fong talked about. But I just want to talk a little bit about this, um, these decadal SST variations. Okay, so this is um, the SST difference between a cold period, um, 2005 to 2015, minus a warm period, the average of 1994 to 2004. Um, this is from PyCush et al. 2017, but similar results were shown in a number of studies. And this is SST from um, NOAA. So you can see this um, cold subpolar gyre and then a relatively warm uh, anomalies in the eastern subtropical gyre sorry, the Western subtropical gyre. And so um, using a heat budget, um, which is shown here, um, Paikash et al. basically showed that these, um, the tendency in the ocean heat content can be explained mostly by the advective heat transport convergence rather than just forcing, but by the air-sea heat flux forcing. So that's uh, comparing the tendency in black to the objective heat transport convergences. And so it appears pretty clear that these advective heat transport convergences um, dominate, um, are, are responsible for these ocean heat content or SST variations. But it's much less clear what portion of the circulation is responsible for these ocean heat transport convergences. Um, Robson et al. claim that, um, that these variations in ocean heat transport convergence are due to the AMOC, um, where Paikash et al. and a number of earlier studies claim that they have to do with variations in the horizontal gyre circulation and the overlying winds. But you know, I'd like to point out that it, it really is difficult to diagnose that because um, while the overlying winds also would, let's say, affect the NAO, which could affect the AMOC, right? And so um, at attributing these um, advective heat transport convergences to either the wind driven circulation or the overturning circulation is quite difficult um, unless you have dedicated model experiments such as what, what was done by Larson. Um, I think I just want to point out that the predictability in the subpolar North Atlantic is also seen in observations. So the models have indicated that um, the subpolar North Atlantic is predictable. Um, there was a, a bunch of studies by Yeager et al. 
And that same predictability is seen in observations. So um, this is the predictability of wintertime SST from um, a set of uh, gridded SST um, products, and it's calculated um, using a measure of the decorrelation time scale. So you can see that predictability is around four or five years and um, in the central subpolar North Atlantic. Um, and it's much lower in the tropics and also in the Labrador Sea. Um, so I would like you to point you to Lori Trenary's poster. It already happened on Monday, but you could give it a look anyway. I'm sure she'd be happy to answer questions. And that will give a comparison of the predictability in um, observations and models and give some insight into the dynamics that might be that are responsible for these um, this predictability. Um, whoops. Oh, I'm having trouble advancing. Um, one thing to recall is that some of this predictability can be just due to one dimensional ocean dynamics. So here I just am showing you the seasonal autocorrelation function of SST anomalies in this subpolar box. And um, you find a strong reemergent signal. So basically um, SST anomalies are isolated beneath the seasonal thermocline and they reemerge the following winter. So there are mechanisms for creating um, SST predictability um, in the subpolar North Atlantic that don't involve um, the AMOC or, or even ocean heat transport convergence. Okay, so just to summarize, um, you know, the ocean overturning circulation is responsible for transporting, is responsible for the ocean heat, transporting heat northward in both hemispheres. And about 60% of the peak ocean heat transport can be related to the AMOC, this uh, circulation that spans warm thermocline waters and the cold mid depth waters. Yet determining the role that the, this overturning circulation plays in ocean heat transport and Atlantic SST is challenging. Um, and I just like to suggest a few um, things that might, problems that perhaps could be more tractable. One possibility is to determine the role of mixed layer processes and 3D ocean dynamics. So separate that way rather than trying to look at the role of the AMOC specifically. Another is to consider the effect of Ekman heat transports, which are basically um, instantaneously forced by the ocean. So Ekman, you can separate into Ekman versus geostrophic heat transport convergence. And another way is looking at the role of wind and buoyancy forcing in SST variations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martha. Any questions? You have about two minutes. I'm going to go up to Michael. Hey, Martha, this is Gail Forget. Uh, nice presentation. Hi, How are you? Good. Um, so, yeah, a couple, couple points or comments. One was, um, so I like, uh, you know, the review you gave. Um, I, I'm kind of an advocate of looking at the ocean heat transport at the equator itself uh, as a way to quantify the part that has to do with the mark. Um, so that was one question. Do you think that makes a bit of sense? Um, in that case, you know, I also like to think about another number, which is the divergence of heat uh, from the surface or across the entire Atlantic, sort of north to south, all the way to Antarctica, right? And the two numbers you get when you do that is there's about 0.5 petawatt that cross the equator, uh -huh. and there's 0.2 yeah. petawatt that come out of the Atlantic. So these are sort of the quantification in my mind of the North Atlantic mark, or the A mark, and the global yeah. mark, 0.5 and 0.2. Um, and so I guess my question is, I see that they are aligned with the numbers you have, so do you agree? And then secondly, if, uh, if I can, um, there's the, this method that I've used in 2019 with Dave Fair to get those numbers, which is called the Helmholtz decomposition. Right? Yeah. And that's a way to disentangle um, the rotational from the divergent components and do what, you know, the kind of computation that Kevin Trenders does, but in a less ad hoc way. Um, is that something you consider as a good idea or do you see drawbacks to that? That's my second question. Thank you. Um, so I, I think that uh, as far as, um, you, so, you know, the, I think the Fox Equatorial 
um, ocean heat transport does seem like you ought to be able to attribute that um, to the AMOC basically. So, you know, in the Pacific, there's basically zero ocean heat transport um, near the equator. Um, I guess that's not, let's see, let's just make sure that the, so uh, I'm trying to look at the green curve. It looks like there is, so there is some cross equatorial ocean heat transport in the Indo-Pacific. Hmm. I'm thinking about why that would be if it's ethane. So I, I think it should work, um, but you know, I haven't uh, thought about it that deeply. Um, as far as the Helmholtz decomposition, I think I do remember reading this paper, but it's been a while. I don't see, um, I don't see a reason uh, that, that it wouldn't work. So um, I, I will be inspired to, to look at that paper again. Um, you know, uh, I, I think we, we all sort of agree now that this vertical uh, horizontal decomposition um, as, as a means of separating the role of the AMOC is, is not a good approach. Um, I, I'm curious as a question back to you, whether this, um, your, your decomposition could work for looking at, let's say the variations in the, in the ocean heat transport. Um, yeah. uh, I so think, scale again. I think so I we have yes. to move on. Okay, no uh, worries. Um, right, I think. Yep, yeah, go sorry, ahead, but, sorry, but I think we have to move on. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. All right. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Chris Pikuch. I hope I don't garble the name uh, from Woods Hole. And the title is Observed Weakening of the Gulf Stream at the Florida Straits over the past four decades. Great. Thanks, Claudia. Um, yeah, I changed my title um, from what's in the program. I overpromised when I submitted my abstract. I said I would tell three stories. That's way too much. I'm going to tell one story. Um, I think it's an important one. So I'm going to try to sway you today. Um, I'm going to try to convince you that the Florida current has declined over the past four decades and that the, the decline is significant, by which I mean it's more than you'd expect from the null hypothesis of a stationary noise process, which I will be much more precise about in a second. And what's really neat and really important, actually, is that this inference of a decline in the Florida current, um, you can see it in multiple observing systems. So let's know what you think. I was really scared to give this talk, but Lisa's like, no, 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 give the talk, see what people say. So just a little bit of context, although we know this already. Um, when we ask about has the AMOC changed, is it changing? We know, as we've heard the past few days, there's a lot of uncertainty. uncertainty. If we think about the past few centuries, we know that there have been some papers that have identified particular proxies, things like sortable silts or oxygen and nitrogen isotopes or marine productivity measures, you know, name your proxy. And folks have argued that there has been a really exceptional decline uh, in the recent past. Um, but of course, as we also know, um, uh, others have either challenged that interpretation of those proxies and or argued that a more comprehensive view of all available proxies that are informative of the circulation in a more complex figure uh, uh, picture in that the, the fate of the circulation over the past couple hundred years is is uncertain um, what i don't think has been stressed enough but has been sort of implicit in some of the things we've been talking about is you don't need to go to the proxy record or the century time scales to encounter uncertainty when it comes to what amoc has done uh, just look at the past couple of decades uh, this is a really nice figure from a paper uh, Matt Menry published a couple of years ago. Um, so we're looking at time along the x-axis over the historical period and AMOC anomaly along the y, by which they mean the anomalous uh, strain function at 1,000 meter steps at 35 north. Uh, the top plot shows a few different model vintages. So the thick colors are multi-model means. The shading is the spread. We've got CMIP 5, 6, and DA MIP. This is the detection and attribution. MIP. Um, lots of really interesting stories to tell pre-1980. I'm not going there. What I want to focus on is the consensus after 1980, which is that, um, as I think some folks said yesterday, the models say we should already be seeing something like a spare drip of decline uh, in the AMOC uh, due to external forcing over the past couple of centuries. And if we look at this bottom plot, this is a, sort of a decomposition of what is driving that decline. And if you believe the DA MIP simulations, it's that the influence of the aerosol forcing kind of levels out once you get to the 1980s. And you can really see the influence of that greenhouse gas forcing. So again, the, the, the CMIP class models say we should already be seeing this um, for a few decades. Only problem is, as some folks in the audience have argued, um, 
Veronica and Yao. Uh, this, is a, this is actually a, a figure from uh, Emma Worthington. Um, folks have used sections along, for example, AO5 or also density measurements along the boundaries to argue that over the past three or four decades, you don't see any decline uh, in, in the AMOC. So in, in Emma's plots here, it's the second from the top. So the orange line is for reconstruction. The blue is rapid. So it's good agreement between Emma's reconstruction and the rapid time series. And, the, and these authors argue that you just see a more or less stable AMOC over this period. So, so what gives? Um, why is there this apparent model data discrepancy? Is it, is it the models? Are they too sensitive to climate forcing? Are they missing some important physics? Or is it the data? Um, you know, are you aliasing some sparse hydrography or are you sort of looking too much at one data set which may ha have idiosyncrasies or, or issues with it that may be clouding the inference? Um, with apologies to Nate Silver, maybe it's just that the signal is lost in the noise of natural variability. And this is what Laura Jackson and her colleagues um, sort of said in their review paper out just a couple months ago. Where they said that the interannual indicator natural variability in the system is so large, it makes it really hard to see any kind of long-term signal. So, so the fact that we don't see it jumping out at us in the data doesn't mean it's not there. Um, so reviewing that literature, I thought to myself, well, does the Florida current have anything to say about this? So I'm going to be very clear. The Florida current is not the AMOC. However, it participates in the AMOC, and it's our best observed current in the world. We have, I mean, this is just a, a figure from Dennis Volkoff's paper in 2020 that just exemplifies how, how many measurements we have of this current. We've got um, almost daily uh, cable-based measurements going back to March 1982. We have quasi-quarterly calibration cruises going across the Florida Straits. Since that same time, and as Dennis has argued in this paper, since the launch of altimetry in 1993, we also have sea surface height, sea surface height based estimates of the change. Um, key connection here is that while, again, the Florida current is not the AMOC, models suggest, so models by Gu and colleagues, also um, Matthew Thomas and also Becky Beedling, uh, all argue that once you get to these multi decadal and longer time scales, you have this coupling and compensation such that when you have a reduction in the deep return flow of the AMOC, that tends to be balanced in, in a mathematician sense by an equal and opposite weakening in the Florida current. So the idea is that on these long time scales, the Florida current may be informative of deep AMOC. So the answer reason, if there is this forced decline in the AMOC and the deep return flow, we may expect to see it in the Florida current. So this is great. We have dynamical reasons to believe we might be seeing the signal uh, in the Florida current. But all this data, awesome, right? Uh, not necessarily. More data doesn't mean more certainty. It means more structure that we have to model, but it doesn't mean more certainty. Or to paraphrase Michael, Michael Scott, who was quoting the notorious BIG, more data, more problems. Um, and just to, to get that across, uh, what I've done here just to demonstrate my point, I've taken those three data sets, the cable, the, the ship sections, and the altimetry, and over their length, so this is Florida current transport, I've just naively fit an ordinary least squares trend line to them. I have purposely not shown any error estimate, because we'll get deep into the weeds of that in a second. But all I want to really demonstrate here is that you get different magnitudes or even signs of the best estimate of the trend. Again, these are all measurements of the same current, of the Florida current. So you get different estimates of the magnitude and sign of the best estimate. So what do we do with this? This is the more data, more problems part. Um, so let's review. Each, each of these data sets is, is incredibly valuable, but has its, you know, has its downsides. The cruise data are, of course, the gold standard. They're, they're very accurate and precise. The problem is, is they're so sparse. You have to worry about the fact that you're painting an incomplete picture and you really have to worry about aliasing. Um, the cable data are, of course, voluminous, um, but they have really complicated error structures. The errors are big, the errors vary in time, and something I don't think is really appreciated enough, the, the errors aren't independent from one daily measurement to another. So we need to account for all that complex structure in the errors. And then finally, altimetry is it, it's great. You've got these regular every you know, nine or 10 day measurements along a steady altimeter track, and that observation platform is stable. Um, but you're not measuring transport, you're measuring sea surface height due to make assumptions about geostrophy and uh, other geophysical processes that may be impacting the sea level record. Um, but the key, I would argue, the key realization to make is what I have here on the bottom, which is that even though these data sets are all imperfect, they are all observing the same underlying reality. And I'm going to try to exploit that um, with how I've decided to, to attack this problem, which is Bayesian hierarchical modeling. Um, in layman's terms, what I'm going to try to do is sort of isolate the common signal to all these data sets while separating it from the noise that's characteristic of each of the individual data sets. Um, two vocab words I need to define, hierarchical and Bayesian. The hierarchical part is, just refers to breaking the problem down into easier chunks. This is a really difficult scientific problem, and we want to break it into easier, sort of more manageable, bite-sized chunks. 
Um, so what we do is we specify a set of equations. Some of those equations relate to the physics, what I call the process level. How do we believe that the Florida current evolves in time? And that specification is different from something like a measurement model. If I have a cable voltage or if I have a, a cruise uh, sort of ACP data, how does that map onto this underlying Florida current process that I'm, that I'm trying to measure? Okay. And the final level is what you can call a parameter or a prior, prior level. This closes the model. And what you do is you specify your prior belief about all of the parameters, be they error variances, uh, decorrelation time scales, et cetera, et cetera, that appear in your process and data levels. Um, so I'm doing on time here. I'm okay. Um, so, so I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds. I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to have me talk their ear off about all the mathematical details. Um, but the, the approach I took here for the process and data levels was to use the autoregressive moving average family of models, or some of you might know them as Box Jenkins models. And my approach, this was really hard, it took me like months to get this right, um, was to, to try to identify the simplest ARMA model that was sufficient to describe the structure in the data. So what I found after lots of experimentation, a lot of failures, finally settled on representing transport as this deterministic bit, a mean plus a seasonal cycle, but allowing for but not demanding a long-term trend. And then uh, AR3 noise, um, that's the transport equation. To give you an example of one of the measurement models, I modeled the cable data as the transport plus this uh, moving average order two um, error structure. The moving average two is really nice because it relates to the uh, three-day averaging that's applied to the cable data. Um, for the priors, I, I just basically pick really uninformative agnostic priors. It's really just to initialize my, my Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm in the right sort of region of parameter space, but they don't really influence the, the posterior solution. Um, that's the hierarchical bit. Bayes' rule allows me to invert this whole model, use numerical methods to generate thousands of ensemble solutions for the Florida current process and all these parameters simultaneously. And the key here is that I'm rigorously propagating the uncertainty and um, this is what I get. This is my reconstruction. So on the top is some summary statistics of my Florida current reconstruction. This is daily values since March 1982. The black is the mean. The gray, if you can see it, is the 95% posterior credible interval or plus or minus two sigma, if you will. Um, again, key here is that I have these at daily values every single day. There's no gaps in this data set and I have thousands of them. So I can, I can do really nice statistics with this. Just to give you a, a more concrete sense, I've zoomed in here. Um, to the year uh, 2019. Um, the gray and the black are the model. All the different colored symbols are the data that I've assimilated. You can see that the model fits the data really tightly where the data are present. But this really interesting period in the middle of the year where you lose the cable data, the errors inflate, which is what you'd hope and what you'd expect. I've also drawn these, these purple and green lines as just two randomly chosen ensemble members, just to remind you that I do have an ensemble of thousands of members, not just summary statistics. Um, speaking of errors, so this is a plot here of a time series of the standard error on the, re uh, on the reanalysis every day since 1982, um, so essentially the posterior standard deviation. Um, very interpretable structure. You see larger, so this is the black curve. You get the largest values in 1998, 1999. This is when you lost the cable for about a year and a half, and so the errors are larger because the inference is only based on altimetry and the cruise tracks. You do see elevated values in the 90s as well. This was a period when the cable was in active telecommunications use, so the voltages were, were more noisy. Um, you can one see these minute, big spikes. Minute. One minute? Okay. Um, I'll get to the punchline. The errors are cool. Ask me about them. This is what matters. The Florida current de declined. Uh, uh, not yet. So this is, this is a plot that shows you that you should believe the error bars I produce because it says that my estimate is about twice as accurate as the errors quoted on the cable measurement. I'll talk to you more about that later, but just to get to the punchline, sorry, I'm droning on here. This is the, this is the, the, the big headline result. Here I'm showing that I'm inferring a change of minus 1.2 fair trip for the past 40 years. It's significant. More than 99% of my ensemble members show this. Um, to quantify how sensitive that inference is to each of the three data sets I bring in, I performed three additional data assimilation experiments. Each one I left out one of the data sets. So for example, the second row is the run where I just didn't include altimetry, just based on the cable data and the ship data. Uh, gives you basically the same number, same thing if you lose the cruise data. All three of those give you minus 1.2. The real neat one was this last one right, where I dropped the cable data. This is the strongest constraint because these data are so voluminous, but I still, it's a bit weaker, a bit more muted, but still in more than 95% of my ensemble members, I infer that there was a decline over the past four decades. Um, and I don't have time to go into this, but I'm sort of stressing that aliasing matters when you're dealing with sparse data like hydrography. Um, da -da -da. So, 
feel like my rushing at the end may have taken away from convincing you of these points, but I hope I convinced you that the Florida current has declined, it's significant uh, relative to some, some clearly specified null hypothesis, and you can see it in multiple observing systems. So any comments now or later? Let's, Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think we'll skip questions, move on to the next speaker. You can find Chris here or online. I see him online too. Um, so let's go on to the next speaker. Claudia? Yes, okay. So the next speaker is Dan Amrain from NCA talking about what are the dominant atmospheric drivers of interannual AMOC variability. All right, we're just hooking him up now to the mic. Excellent, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I'd like to start out by acknowledging my collaborators um, at the University of Washington, Luann Thompson and Noah Rosenberg. Uh, we had some uh, good conversations with Ichiro Fukumori and Diabor Kostov, and particularly highlight the role that's my turn to struggle with this. Um, of David Stevenson, who is a postdoc at NCAR working on this project and has really brought a lot of expertise and enthusiasm, um, but unfortunately I couldn't attend this meeting. So today I'm going to describe uh, a new tool that we've developed for identifying connections between atmospheric and ocean variability. Um, and this Um, motivation for this is a conversation that's been ongoing um, to think about um, a process such as um, transport in the AMOC as having a sum of components, um, for instance, decomposing the AMOC into components owing to buoyancy forcing, um, wind forcing, particular, or perhaps on some particular time scale. And then, you know, based on this, we can talk about the variance of um, this quantity, and you can think about the variance of its constituents as being um, a diagnostic of which of those constituents may be more or less uh, important. And this work has been explored in several venues. Um, we heard a little bit about one example yesterday in Thierry's work. I wanted to highlight um, some recent publications from David actually in his um, thesis. So here um, David was looking at the influence of wind strat, um, buoyancy forcing at subgrid and uh, model grid scales um, at uh, AMOC strength, uh, sorry, AMOC variance at two latitudes, uh, 25 and 55 north at different time scales. Um, David can give you the full story on this, but basically as we see this system spin up, which tells you something about predictability, um, these different components drive uh, variability in different ways at different places and different latitudes um, in the Atlantic Ocean. And the way that David did this, and the thing I'll talk about today, is to use an ocean model adjoint. This gives us basically a recipe from an ocean model that connects the things that we think might drive ocean variability to things like atmospheric fluxes. Um, so the way that this works, um, our, we're going to call our adjoint sensitivity S, and this tells us basically the partial derivative of some quantity of interest in the ocean, such as AMOC strength, um, to something that might drive it. Um, we call them controls, but today I'll talk mostly about surface heat fluxes. So to give an example, um, this is a figure from Pillar et al. 2016, where they diagnosed adjoint sensitivities um, of AMOC strength at 26 north in January to surface heat fluxes. And so you can see this is a map, um, actually two maps here, because the adjoint gives us the history of forcings um, and how they might influence the AMOC. So we see that at short time scales, um, the way you affect 26 north is most effectively is to change the heat really just, you know, very close in latitude um, to the, the section of interest at 26 north. But at longer time scales, there are more remote influences that um, conspire to affect AMOC uh, even at 15 years later. Um, so in, in this sense, we can think of these adjoint sensitivities as being the optimal drivers. Um, and we get them from an ocean model and they reflect ocean length scales and these structures of interest that we set up like the, the AMOC. But in the spirit of variance budgets, where we're thinking about um, you know, these quantities being driven by things like the atmosphere that have their own length scales and statistics, um, can we derive sensitivities um, that, that well, particularly, can we derive atmospheric patterns um, that are most responsible for driving ocean variance? This is kind of the motivating question today. Um, so there's a little bit of math because it is the, the work, but this is it. Um, so the, our adjoint sensitivities allow us to write AMOC as a linear function um, of the flux history in time and space. 
And so if we, take, if we compute the variance in this way, you end up with this kind of quadratic product. And um, this is the part where we had to spend a couple of months and some, some coffee on this thing. But it turns out that um, the variance is also given, um, oh, sorry. So then, right, so actually this, this second line is this beautiful problem where you're looking at this space-time covariance, um, but we're prevented in having to deal with this thing by making a white noise assumption, which reduces things, and we can, only, we can think just about spatial covariances. Um, and then if you think about um, this matrix, matrix as a sandwich, um, it turns out the magic step for us was to turn the sandwich around. And uh, this was actually what victory looked like for us, believe it or not. It was this bad analogy inspired by uh, my one-year-old who eats sandwiches this way. Um, but the, the, the reason it's useful is because we end up with kind of a funny looking atmospheric covariance matrix. It has coordinates of the atmospheric system itself, but its units are in the variance of AMOC. And so when we compute the eigenvectors of this thing, we get the atmospheric patterns um, whose variability maximizes the variance of the quantity of interest. Um, there's one other step that we do to orthogonalize these things in time that I can talk about for interested audiences. And so there's a couple of nice limiting cases here. Um, in the case where um, our fluxes are white noise in space, then we recover these um, so-called optimal patterns for stochastic excitation, which have been studied before. And then the limit where the adjoint sensitivities um, do not impose any spatial structures themselves, then we just recover the atmospheric EOS. Um, and we call these things, yeah, voila. Uh, for now, we're calling them coughs. It's kind of unfortunate, but, you know, they're combined orthogonal functions. Um, okay, so what does this actually look like? Um, so we're going to test this in um, an MIT GCM um, setup. Um, it's just the Echo version 4 setup. Um, this has been spun up for 4,800 years, uh, thanks to Chris Wolf for sharing the solution with us. And it's an adjointed and run to compute the sensitivities of AMOC uh, maximum volume uh, transport at the climatological maximum depth at annual and decadal averages at several different latitudes. And we're also using fluxes um, to get the statistics of these fluxes, and that's also from the ECHO solution. So this is just showing the, uh, the, the AMOC stream function in you know, comparing our spun-up version to ECHO. Close enough not to invalidate any results. Um, so, okay, so let's, let's look at these, what these different patterns um, look like. So we can start out by thinking about um, what the leading pattern is, the sort of stochastic optimal for AMOC variance at 55 north by heat fluxes. So this is what the ocean model wants to see. If you wanted to really excite variance, you'd give it this pattern. By contrast, this is the leading EOF of heat fluxes that we see computed over the roughly 30 years of the ECHO solution. So this is more characteristic of what we think of as atmospheric variability patterns, larger in scale, um, length scale. But now if we combine these two things, or we use this cough approach, um, we obtain this third pattern, um, which is, you know, somewhere in between uh, both of these things. I think it's an interesting feature of these figures is that for the most part, our, kind of our cough is um, selecting this kind of Labrador C-centric um, uh, nodes there, but it's kind of leaving out this maximum off of Scotland. I think this is characteristic of ocean variability in that there are kind of latent pathways for the ocean to be, uh, you know, tickled that the atmosphere just isn't looking at. Um, I'd also comment that um, very similar uh, of these coughs um, were found across latitudes and regardless of whether targeting annual or decadal AMOC variability. And we'll get back to that at the end. Um, so if these patterns look familiar, we can do the usual kind of thing and compute the leading EOF of the sea level pressure. We can regress that principal component onto the heat fluxes. Regress that component onto the heat flux. There we go. Um, and we see something that looks very familiar, kind of strikingly familiar. And thanks to John for uh, sending along his uh, copyrighted meme there. Um, so, it, you know, this, this pattern, we've really recovered something that looks a lot like um, the, the NAO. Um, so then to look at the impact of these things and compare them to what we get from the EOF, um, we ran a series of what we're calling perturbed echo simulations, where we rerun the echo state estimate, um, but regressing out these patterns uh, that we've computed. So I just wanted to point out here that across time scales, um, the, when we remove the, this cough, we remove substantially more variance than we do at removing the EOF. So maybe not surprising, that, you know, but um, the leading patterns of atmospheric variability are not necessarily the leading patterns that contribute to ocean variability. Um, and so what does this look like? How is this working? So at the top, um, these are the time series 
of the two different patterns. There's a strong seasonal cycle there. I apologize, this, I think this horizontal axis got a little messed up. But the effect of this is that on decadal time scales, by removing um, this cough, we're basically scooting the AMOC uh, lower over the first roughly 15 years of the record and then higher um, over the second to kind of counteract the variability that appears in the echo solution. And um, when we look at um, the progression of this or the effect um, of removing this signal as a function of time scale, so this is going from a one month low pass filter to a one year, three year, five year, and 10 year low pass on the bottom, we find that um, the impact of variance reduction has the greatest spatial extent on a long time scale. And I think this is consistent with the schematic that we saw um, yesterday. And uh, Martha really intro nicely introduced um, some of these concepts as well. Um, the notion that um, the buoyancy forcing um, has a greater role in the subtrop in the sub polar gyre um, on shorter time scales than it does uh, in the subtropical gyre. So we see a similar decay here. Um, but I would also I would also point out that when we look um, at the sort of um, optimals for the uh, uh, horizontal and meridional wind stress, we do not see these identical patterns um, in space and time as we did before. So I guess this is leading us to hypothesize now that. Um, these that non-NAO components of the wind stress, while might, maybe not um, important for the uh, variability itself, might be um, important for driving meridional asynchrony because we see differences in the sensitivity patterns as a function of latitude. One minute. Thank you. Great. So I'll just um, wrap up there. So model adjoints tell us what the ocean wants from the atmosphere. Um, we can look at EOFs to figure out what the dominant modes of atmospheric variability are. Uh, we've Develop this technique um, to try to combine these things and find the atmospheric patterns that dominate ocean variability. We see these NAO-like heat flux patterns um, that I think really reprise a lot of the um, results that we saw in Martha's talk. Um, I just say, ask me about how we can use some, um, approaches like this to um, also filter data assimilation increments and um, hopefully make those solutions more practical. And of course, there are some caveats. These are linear sensitivities in an ocean-only model, and we're assuming stationary statistics of the fluxes. Um, I would end with this um, nice note from David who says, who points out that um, if you are interested in running um, ocean adjoints or um, computing them, then he'd be happy to help. So that's all. Thanks a lot. Time for one question in the back. I noticed that your optimal forcing pattern highlighted the Labrador Sea. So can you tell us whether ECHO compares well to the OSNAP observations? Um, I can't off the top of my head. Um, I know that they're not included. So they would, they would at least provide an independent test. I don't know that. Gael, do you know the answer to that question? Okay. I'm absolved. Not, not on top of my head, yeah. But I will look. We have time for one other question. Hey, yeah, very nice presentation. Uh, my question is, is there a way you could use the adjoint of MIT-GCM to look at the sort of CMIP run in that way? Is there a way to combine the two? I feel like this question comes up a lot. You know, we have this adjoint of this model, whereas we don't for others. Um, I think it would be really interesting, you know, if these adjoint patterns that we infer can also tell us something about the um, circulation in these other models. Then it's a really interesting tool, right? Because I've assumed stationary fluxes here, but we're looking at non-stationarity in the future. And so it'd be very interesting to think about um, how that non-stationarity and climate variability would contribute to non-stationary ocean variability. But I think it, I, I'm not, I don't know that we can do that, but it's a very interesting question. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, Claudia, next speaker. Yeah. So the next speaker is Matthias Langhorst from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and he will be talking about the Atlantic Middle Overturning Circulation Observed at 16 knots. Yes, I, I think uh, I'm, uh, you, you, can you hear me and can you see the screen? All good. Okay, um, cool. There is, okay. there, yeah, you're good. Um, 
Yes, this is uh, uh, the observational record from the MOVE project, Meridional Overturning Variability Experiment. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Janis Kerling and Uwe Send, as well as our funding agency, that's the US NOAA, specifically their Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program. And many years ago, MOVE was started as a German project funded by the BMBF agency there. I will be uh, talking about the following topics. I'll present our 21-year observational time series, followed by a look at numerical simulations uh, trying to reproduce uh, the observations. Uh, then we'll venture into the fields of satellite gravimetry uh, and also water masses and salinity issues. Uh, last but not least, I'll conclude with uh, comparisons to the 26 North observations from the rapid array. MOVE measures uh, the southward limb of the AMOC at a location east of the Caribbean, shown on the map there. Um, that's the North Atlantic deep water, NADW, as it flows across that yellow dashed line. We have moorings at the three dots on the map, and the bottom right uh, sketch shows a side view of the array. The colors match the, the dots on the map there. Uh, we compute the ocean volume transport in that NADW depth layer as the sum of three components. First, there's the boundary component. That's the wedge above the continental slope on the west that's observed with current meters on the, on the magenta and the orange mooring there. Then there's the internal component. That's geostrophy relative to a, a level of no motion computed from temperature and salinity instruments on the orange and the yellow mooring. That covers most of the uh, water uh, column uh, and section width there. And last but not least, there's the external component observed with seafloor pressure sensors at the base of these uh, yellow and orange moorings. And that is effectively the reference level for, for the geostrophic computations. Now, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, there is the assumption that just this western basin and that restricted depth range actually tells us something important about the AMOC. Is it really enough? Do we learn something from that? That is an assumption that goes into the array. And then for the boundary current, uh, that is relatively easy to measure, but it does not matter all that much. It does not dominate the signal. The internal uh, transport dominates the signal. Uh, and uh, if you care about that, you're forever calibrating salinity instruments. Um, last not least, the reference level, uh, the external transport, cannot measure long time scales because the pressure records have to be detrended. Multi-year variability is removed as well. This then is our 21-year record. It's the sum of the boundary and the internal. I'm not including the ex external part for now. Uh, it's the volume transport uh, of the NADW starting in early 2000. We presently have data through late 2020. The moorings are still in the water and we're hoping to add to this time series uh, later this year when we recover them again. Negative numbers denote the southward flow. So uh, more negative means actually means stronger flow. Earlier this year, I reprocessed the salinity data for the internal transport. I'll have a couple more slides later. Um, but that did not fundamentally change the decadal trends. It did change the wiggles of those wiggly lines a bit though. So the time series does look a bit different visually from what I showed four years ago. Um, we are interested in long-term changes, decadal trends, that sort of thing. Uh, here's the decadal trends, just fit a straight line to the first and the last tenure of the record. In the first, uh, in the first part, it's it's decreasing, and in the second uh, part, it's it's increasing again. And yes, I said that right. Remember, it's plotted with uh, negative numbers here. In the numerical um, uh, simulations, uh, we are trying to test uh, assumptions that go into uh, into these uh, observations. And this is a study that was led by Gokhan Dana Bajulu in uh, in uh, over the past two or three years through their AMOC metrics project. In particular, we're addressing the following assumptions. Is that Western Basin restricted depth NADW layer really representative of MOC as a whole? And is it OK to ignore that external transport like I did in the previous plot? Uh, and the figures on the right uh, are from their models. Uh, the upper one shows volume transport at 16 north. Uh, and the bottom one shows 10-year trends. And all the different color lines are different constellations in the model. You don't have to look at all of them. 
to address the first question, look at the upper one and compare the orange line versus the black line, long story short, the answer is yes. The Western Basin NADW layer is actually correlated with MOC, with high correlation coefficients on long time scales. But you have to look at time scales longer than four years. So don't worry about this year to year wiggles, only look at the long term signals. The second question, uh, we can look at the lower panel. Is, is it OK to, ex to ignore that reference level? And, and, and that is unfortunately not so great. You have to look at the orange lines. There's a dashed one and a solid one. You compare those two. They're correlated with something like 0.4. Better than nothing, but it's not as good as we want it to be, right? Uh, that takes me to the conclusion on the, on the lower left there. We should be looking only at multi-year timescales and move. And we should include a measure of the external transport. Well, this then is a measure of the external transport. Our own pressure measurements don't have the, the long-term trend in the external, as I said earlier. Uh, instead, uh, we resort to uh, the satellite gravimetry from the GRACE mission. Um, that comes with a, with a data product uh, that, that is effectively seafloor pressure. But when you talk to the experts, uh, they will always caution you against using the long-term trends in these data unless you can validate them. Well, Janis Kerling did validate them against independent data, against satellite altimetry together with hydrography, um, uh, repeat hydrography as well as long-term mooring deployments uh, at multiple locations, dozen, a dozen or so locations across all over the North Atlantic. And these long-term trends in that particular data product from GRACE checked out okay. Um, therefore, we're now using them with confidence uh, as the external transport for our move array. It doesn't cover the full 21 years, but we're looking at, at 16 or 17 years. Um, uh, and, and that's what's shown here. It's the same data as I showed earlier, but the reference level from GRACE has now been added to it. Uh, and lo and behold, the long-term uh, decadal trends uh, still point in the same direction. This is what I showed earlier without the external. Uh, and, and the upper panel uh, includes the, the, the GRACE reference level, we conclude it's still decreasing in the first half of the record, increasing in the second half of the record. Then I briefly want to venture into the realm of, of salinity calibrations. Um, the bottom two panels show depth time plots of salinity anomaly at each, at each mooring. The bottom left is the western mooring, bottom right uh, uh, the eastern mooring. And if you look at this long enough, I'm going to see if you can see my mouse here. The first, uh, the first parts uh, of the Western mooring you, are dominated by, by orangish colors. And you see more blue in the second half uh, of the record. So there are long-term salinity changes that we're seeing. But if you look at the, at, the, at the color scale, you see that they're very small. And if you look at the Eastern mooring, there are also changes. But the phasing and the magnitude is different. And, and you have to get the phasing and the magnitude of these, uh, of these salinities right. Otherwise, your densities are not right, and therefore your geostrophic currents are not right. The upper right panel shows the same salinities, but averaged over the middle 2,000 meters depth. The blue line uh, uh, is the western mooring and the red line the eastern mooring. And there you can also, in the blue line, for example, you can see that, that change from the earlier to the, to the later years. But you can also see that this y-axis has a little note times 10 to the minus 3. So these are changes uh, in thousandths of salinity unit. And uh, be reminded uh, that the typical measurement accuracy of a ship CTD is something like 3 thousandths. And in fact, the original equation to compute salinity from conductivity is, 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 uh, has a residual misfit between 1 and 2 thousandths. So these, these are small signals that are not much bigger uh, than what is uh, technically feasible to measure. And we've uh, gone through a number of uh, uh, calibration procedures at sea, and I've uh, modified those. I've added one additional method to them earlier this year, and I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to walk you through all of this. Um, instead, uh, we're going to get back uh, to our transport time series. Do ask me about these salinities, though I care about them. And um, this is the, uh, uh, the transport time series uh, that I showed earlier, move uh, with the GRACE reference level applied. And I now want to compare that uh, with the observations from the 26 North Array Rapid. Um, I downloaded that time series two weeks ago. I hope it's still current. 
uh, and that's, uh, that's what's shown in the red line. I plotted it upside down, so with a sign inverted, so that it fits on my, on my, on my plot here. And, and the straight lines there are also just naively fitting um, linear trends to, to the first and the second half of the record. And, and, and I, would, I would argue that they agree pretty well. We're seeing a decrease in the, in the first half of the record and an increase uh, in the second half. Um, perhaps the magnitude in the first part is a bit different, but uh, those two trend lines in the second half are right on top of one another. Uh, and this is somewhat surprising because in the past we had been thinking that they don't agree. Uh, in fact, we've written papers about the disagreement and wondering why they're disagreeing, although we're seeing similar changes in salinity. Uh, and this figure was shown by Gokhan on Monday. It comes from a study led by Eleanor Freiker Williams, where we were trying to investigate these differences. The black line there is the was the move uh, time series at the time, and the red one, uh, the, the rapid MOC. And the shading there indicates what we thought the trends would be, and they're going in, in, in opposite directions. And, and we were very concerned about that. Uh, knowing what I know now, I think we should have we should have plotted the trend lines like this. Uh, and then they would look a lot more similar. Um, and also, my salinity reprocessing, I should mention, took some of those black uh, black lobes uh, away. They were where I added that S reprocessing box, some of these peaks have been smoothed out by my reprocessing. So that, that kind of visually guides you more to this, to this uh, uh, change increase first, uh, uh, decrease later. Um, so I'm hopeful uh, that we finally resolve these disagreements uh, with a little bit of reprocessing and also by having longer time series uh, that allow us to see those long-term trends better. This does come with a word of caution, though. Um, a lot of what I'm showing depends on grace. Uh, and uh, there is a study by Emma Worthington that says that the long-term grace trends are not consistent with the rapid compensation term um, that they use to compute their MOC. On shorter annual, interannual time scales, it works fine, but the long-term trends uh, uh, still need to be checked there. So there's, there is some work to be, uh, to be done before we fully believe all that. And also, there are GRACE data from the GRACE follow-on satellites that are more recent than 2018. But if I had included those in the plot up there, uh, uh, there would be trends in there that'd be off the chart. So um, the, the more recent uh, GRACE analyses um, are, are, not, are not ready for, 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 for us to use yet. And uh, that requires further study. Here's what the time series would look like uh, without grace. Uh, so still uh, we're seeing the same trends uh, decreasing in the first half, uh, increasing in the second half. And uh, it compares reasonably favorably. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm walking away from this wondering why I ever thought uh, there was disagreement. Uh, I feel foolish for ever thinking that was the case. So to conclude, uh, we have a 21-year observational record uh, at 60 North and MOVE. We're seeing these decadal trends uh, with or without satellite gravimetry. Um, we're seeing the MOC uh, strength decreasing in the decade of the 2000s. We're seeing it increasing in the decades of the 2010s. And the magnitude of these trends is something on the order of three sverdrops per decade, somewhere between zero and five, a single digit number. Um, and we have increased confidence uh, in these results because we've looked again at the numerical simulations to validate our our observing system design, and we're including we're including grace in this. The um, agreement uh, of these trends with with the 26 North observation uh, was new to us. Uh, we uh, had thought there was disagreement, and we think this uh, we think they're actually in agreement now. Um, and that is perhaps due to my reprocessing of the salinity data that makes the some of the bumps go away, and also just for being more patient and uh, having longer records available to us now. I want to uh, uh, quit on the note that MOVE is part of the International Ocean Sites Program. We make all of our data publicly available at the Ocean Sites data centers. And I'm still working on, on posting the reprocessed versions there. Uh, they're not there yet, but I, I, I pledge to have done this within a month from now. Uh, and that's all I have for today. So thank you for listening. All right, let's take one question before we go to break. The toss up between Chris and Gokhan. Chris. 
Hi, Matthias. This is Chris from Woods Hole. Um, very cool that you're bringing in, Grace. Um, you're on, at least on the west, you're in a very steep bathymetric slope. Do you have to worry about, one, the course resolution of the satellite observations, and two, the fact that you're right at a plate boundary and potential other geophysical signals getting in there? <laughs> yes, we are worried about that, uh, definitely. Uh, and when I said we validated these long-term trends, Yanis actually took the whatever grid point and validated it against altimetry plus our move TNS, um, uh, and it checked out okay. So that compared favorably to, to Grace at that particular grid point, whichever one he chose. So we take that as, as sufficient validation. On, longer, on shorter timescales, we have our pressure sensors, of course. But uh, yeah, that, that is a concern. We think we, we, think we validated it, but it, it's a concern. All right, and I was told Gokhan has a comment he wants to make real quick. I've been saying for a while that if you wait long enough, the observations will match the modeling results, and I think this is one of the recent examples of that. <laughs> okay, I, um, and if we wait long enough, the model salinities match the observations. There also is a question in the chat. I'm not sure if we ran out of time. I'll, I'll answer uh, in the chat, that's fine. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. Let's go on for a break. I think we meet back here in one and a half. All right, so I think most everyone is back in the room. So Claudia, do you want to introduce our new next speaker? Okay. Uh, yeah, so our next speaker is Aik uh, and she will be talking about the Hyotomi. Ah between freshwater and heat flux effects on oceanic conveyor belt stability and global climate. Sorry for my bad pronunciation. <laughs> okay. All right, this work is in collaboration with uh, Jerry Mio, I Ayako Abiochi, Wei Han, Betty Otto Blissner, Tung Wen Wu, Nan Rosenblum, and uh, Gary Strand. So we have been talking about AMAC almost a whole week. Everybody knows the AMAC. The reason we care about AMAC, I think, is uh, two. One is because AMAC transports significant amount of heat into the subpolar North Atlantic, which the change of AMAC can significantly change the regional and uh, global climate. Second is uh, the AMAC heatrate behavior. That means uh, in response to the change of external forcing, AMAG can collapse suddenly, inducing an abrupt climate change event. From the Greenland Anticloud record, we can see there's a multiple or abrupt climate change event happened in the last gradual period. This we call it the Dancing Reddit and Oscar event or the Henrik event. And privacy data also suggests that during the Henrik event, a significant change of the temperature is related to a significant weakening of the AMAC. For the future warmer climate and the greenhouse gas forcing, in CMF6 model and also CMF5 and uh, before, we also show a weakening of AMAC due to the increase of greenhouse gas. That means uh, potentially maybe a change of greenhouse gas and also induce a AMAX heatrisis behavior. So here, we basically ask for two questions. One is uh, whether the AMAX heatrisis depending on the background climate condition. And second one is where, whether the fresh water induced AMAX heatrisis will differ from that induced by greenhouse gases. To do this, we use um, NCAR CCSM3 and CCSM4 model. For CCSM3, the horizontal resolution for atmosphere and the ocean, no, and the land is T42 or 2.8 degrees. For ocean and CS is one degree. And CCSM4, the horizontal resolution is one degree for all components. Here, using CCSM3, we did three paired experiments. In these three experiments, everything is identical except the balance tree is closed for one simulation and open for another. And for future 
greenhouse gas boson experiment, we use CCSM4. For the first three experiments, we have a one site and meet glacial condition, which is about 15,000 15, years before present day. The other two experiments under 1990 condition, we call it modern fast and modern slow. For the meet glacial condition, we have a 100 cubic meter per second fresh water forcing added into subpolar North Atlantic between 50 and 70 degrees 70 degree north. And this forcing increases the same amount every year for 1,500 years, then the fresh water forcing starts to decrease. For the modern fast, this experiment, the fresh water forcing added between 20 and 50 degrees north, with the amount is 200 cubic meter per second and the increment is the same every year. And for the modern slow, the fresh water forcing is half of that for modern fast. As a result, for the modern fast, the experiment ran about like 4,500 years, and for the modern slow, it ran about 9,000 years. In the future DRG experiment, we basically run the historic forcing from 1850 to 2005, Afterwards, it is RCP 8.5 to 2300. And then we keep the forcing at 2300 level for 300 years to let the surface climate equilibrium with the forcing. Then we reverse the forcing of RCP 8.5 back to 2005 and then further reverse forcing to 1850. Now, let's look at the results. This is the AMAC index, which we define as the maximum of the meridian stream function in the Atlantic below 500 meter depth between 40 and 60 degrees north. The black and the red line, that's closed bearing series simulation, and blue green line is open bearing series simulation. And black line and blue line is the fresh water forcing increasing phase, and the red and the green line is fresh water forcing decreasing phase. So basically, here we can see that with an open bearing street, the change of freshwater forcing and the change of the AMAC is roughly linear. That means uh, with the increase of freshwater forcing, AMAC decreases until it collapses. With AMAC, with freshwater forcing decrease, the AMAC just linearly strengthens. For the simulation with a closed bearing street, we have a clear, like the initially slowly weakens the AMAC, then it collapses for all these closed bearing series simulation. And when fresh water forcing decrease, it stays in the soft mode for a while before it restarts again. And this simulation actually agrees much better with the previous simpler model results under, let's see, modern condition, fresh water forcing ID the same place as ours. It's a closed bearing street to show this historical behavior. And the glacial condition, fair water forcing ID in the subpolar North Atlantic, is also, you will see a much narrower historical loop. So you may ask, why with the open bearing street, it doesn't have a historical, but with the closed bearing street, it does? Actually, the other thing I also want to say is under future DRG experiment, with the Increasing of a greenhouse gas forcing, we see the AMAC weakens and then collapse. When we have the greenhouse gas decrease, the AMAC stays in the off mode until the greenhouse gas is about 900 ppm wave, then it starts to recover. When the, first, when the greenhouse gas forcing is below 600 ppm wave, it really recovers fast and overshoots almost twice as strong as the control run before it is and weakens and towards the control strength. If you look at the volume transport at Baron Street, we basically say that when A market decreases, we say a weakening of the Baron Street transport, and even it can reverse direction for these two modern experiments. But for the under greenhouse gas forcing, Initially, the volume transport doesn't change much, and then it decreases. When AMAC stays in the off mode, the balance rate transport is also low. When it starts to recover, the balance rate volume 
turns out also increase. But if we look at the fresh water turns out as a balance sheet, what we see is uh, although A mark weakens, actually the balance sheet fresh water volume turns out is increased. This increased fresh water turns out through the balance sheet, it will it helps to clap the A mark. And when A mark is in a collapsed mode, the fresh water transfer through the balance sheet is actually still higher than the pre industrial. That means this additional fresh water forcing at least uh, contributed to the birth state of the A mark when the CO2 forcing decreased. To further quantify the rate of change of the A mark in response, to the fresh water forcing or to the greenhouse gas forcing, we calculated the piecewise trend for the all the experiments. The black line is the open balance sheet simulation and blue line is the closed balance sheet simulation. We can clearly see the class of restarts of the AMAC in this fresh water forcing experiment is much faster with the closed balance sheet than the open balance sheet one. For the greenhouse gas forcing one, we can particularly pay attention to the CO2 decreasing phase. We have a large increase of the AMAC. By changing the AMAC, actually, we can also affect global and regional climate. First, let's take a look of the global mean temperature and also southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere temperature change. Basically, we can see that with the collapsing of the AMAC, we have a decrease of the global temperature, and this decrease is mostly due to the decrease of temperature in the northern hemisphere, but the southern hemisphere, the temperature is slightly increased. And this change is larger, the difference of the change between northern and southern hemisphere is larger in the open barrier simulation than the closed one. This is the reason for that is with a closed balance sheet, there's a change corresponding to the cleft AMAX. There's a change to the circulation in the Pacific, which reduces, uh, partly actually compensates the meridian heat redu transport reduction due to the cleft AMAX. In a future climate, actually, there's a, the temperature is a little bit complicated. Actually, at the beginning of the experiment, the northern hemisphere temperature increased faster than the southern hemisphere. But later on, that part of the chain is agreed with uh, the fresh water forcing experiment. The reason for that is uh, the polar amplified warming in the northern hemisphere is messed up the response. In the fresh water hosting experiment, the polar region, the temperature is significantly decreased but in the, first, in the greenhouse gas forcing experiment, that's when actually it's an increase. Next, let's quickly look at the change of the hydrological cycle, the precipitation and the evaporation. The change here basically is the same. The northern hemisphere precipitation and evaporation decrease, southern hemisphere increase. And compare with the fair water forcing experiment and the greenhouse gas forcing experiment, this change is also agree with each other. That means uh, for the future greenhouse gas forcing, the hydrological cycle is intensified for both hemisphere, but this intensification is larger in southern hemisphere than the northern hemisphere. It's very interesting is uh, if we compare this uh, hydrological change between the future experiment and the fresh water hosting experiment, the amplitude of change between the northern and southern hemisphere is roughly the same, which suggests that what we see the difference of the hydrological change between northern and southern hemisphere is primarily due to the change of the AMAC. So in summary, this first Water flux as the dominant forcing. A mark is three depending on the status of the balance sheet, open versus closed, but not depending on the background climate condition. With an open balance sheet, A mark 
has no hysteresis behavior, with the closed bearing tree it does. With greenhouse gas as the dominant protein, AMAC hysteresis do exist. And the clef, the AMAC, induces a cooler and less cloudy, which I didn't mention, northern hemisphere with reduced hydrological cycle, but a warmer and more cloudy southern hemisphere with enhanced hydrological cycle. And the differentiated change of a hydrological cycle between northern and southern hemisphere and the greenhouse gas protein is similar to mainly due to the clef of the AMAC. Thank you. Great, we have two minutes for questions. Here's a question in the room from Dan. Thank you. I was wondering if you could comment on how the, the fate of meltwater and where it might enter the basin um, uh, might affect results like this, I guess, in either of these situations. I guess maybe it's a question for the paleo people too here, like if a, a slowly melting ice sheet would exit in the Mississippi or where it goes, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think uh, in the earlier days, when we do the whole thing, actually, uh, like Betty, she did some experiments and let the water run up into the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico or go to the South Polar North Atlantic. And when she used this one degree model, T42, CSM3, basically, if you have the water run up into the Gulf of Mexico, it's still transported into the South Polar North Atlantic with uh, some delay which eventually will cause the weakening of the AMAC. And yeah, that's the result from CSM3. I do not aware any other model did a similar experiment, uh, whether they have the same result. Yeah. So the location of the fair water protein where you put it, it does affect uh, uh, the change of the AMAC. Thanks. All right, I think we should move on to our next um... Next speaker, we'll save the rest of the questions for the discussion. Okay, so our next speaker is Olivia Gotts at George Mason University. Uh, do interactive ocean dynamics affect North Atlantic SST variability? Oop, sorry guys, <laughs> I'm trying to. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Olivia Gods, and I'm a PhD student at George Mason University. I'd like to acknowledge my advisors, Dr. Martha Buckley and Dr. Tim Del Sol on this work. So I'm going to start by highlighting a study that asked if interactive ocean dynamics affect a mode of SST variability, specifically called the Atlantic Multidecadal Variability, or AMV. The AMV has been historically thought to be due to variations in the ocean, but a study by Clement et al. in 2015 showed that the AMV can be reproduced in models without interactive ocean dynamics. What's shown in this figure here, and I just want you guys to focus on the colors in this figure, is the AMV index regressed onto the SST anomalies in observations in A, fully coupled models in B, and slab ocean models in D. And a slab ocean model is when an atmosphere is coupled to a motionless slab ocean, and in these models, the interactive ocean is unable to force SST anomalies. The fact that uh, the fully coupled models and the slab ocean models have almost identical SST anomalies associated with the AMV cause these authors to conclude that the AMV doesn't require interactive ocean dynamics. However, this result has been debated by numerous studies outlined below. So we're gonna get at understanding the role of interactive ocean dynamics and SST through analyzing a hierarchy of models similar to Clement et al. We're gonna be using the CSM lens model. Um, we're gonna be using fully coupled models and slab ocean models. We're using pre-industrial control runs and we use a 900 year monthly time series. Um, for the slab ocean model, that's a coupled model with the same atmosphere and ice model as the fully coupled model, but the ocean's replaced by a motionless slab. This model interacts thermodynamically with the atmosphere, but there are no time variable currents, temperature, advection, diffusion, or other one-dimensional ocean processes. This slab attempts to reproduce the fully coupled model SST climatology, and the slab layer in this model is set to be the mixed layer depth from the fully coupled model, which is shown in this figure here. 
So first we're gonna ask, does Atlantic SST differ between models with and without interactive ocean dynamics? Recall that Clement showed that the A and B may differ, but we take a broader approach and we try to include more modes of SST variability beyond the A and B. In order to do this, we first computed the logarithm, the natural logarithm ratios of surface temperature variance um, for monthly data for the slab ocean model SST over the fully coupled model SST. So one thing that you'll be marked by this plot is that essentially most of the values are positive, which means that the slab ocean model contains generally more SST variance than the fully coupled model in the majority of the Atlantic basin. And the stippling just indicates where the log ratio is insignificant. So most of these values are significant. The only region where the fully coupled model appears to have more variance in SST than the slab is in the tropical Atlantic here. And if you want to get an idea of exactly how much more variance one model has than the other by looking at this plot, you can take the color bar and raise it to the power, or E and raise it to the power on the color bar. So this is saying that essentially in the Gulf Stream, the slab ocean model has four and a half times more SST variance than the fully coupled model. And this is just a local plot. So we want to be able to separate these modes of variability um, and really understand what what is going on beyond this general picture so now we want to quantify these differences in a more rigorous way in order to do that we're going to be using a technique called covariance discriminant analysis and this is a really brief overview and if you have more questions about the technique feel free to ask me about it later but broadly this method finds a linear combination of variables that maximize a ratio of variance and the ratio of variance that we're going to be optimizing is this lambda over here and it essentially takes the variance in the slab ocean model um, over the variance in the fully coupled model. And from CDA, we're gonna get three things. One is an ordering of these lambdas, which are the variance ratios. We're gonna get time series called variates. And we're also gonna get spatial patterns called loading vectors that describe the modes that contain the most differences in variance between the slab ocean model and the fully coupled model. So what's shown here is just the lambda, so the discriminant ratios for our analysis on SST. What's shown on the y-axis is the value of the discriminant ratio, and what's shown on the x-axis is the component number. And as you can see, they're ordered from the largest discriminant ratio to the smallest discriminant ratio. This black line represents our sample um, of computing CDA from two different models for the slab over the fully coupled model. As you can see, there are more values where the lambda is greater than one, and that indicates where the slab ocean model contains more variance than the fully coupled model. When lambda is less than one, that indicates where the fully coupled model contains more SST variance than the slab ocean model. This gray line here characterizes our null hypothesis of equal SST variance. And as you can see, our sample is significantly different from the null hypothesis line, which leads us to reject the null hypothesis of equal SST variance between the slab and the fully coupled models. We've highlighted four modes that we're gonna be looking at in more detail throughout this talk. And first, I'm going to be focusing on the modes that have more SST variance in the slab ocean model. And we're going to explore what these patterns look like. So this is the first component with more variance in the slab ocean model. Um, this is kind of just showing what you get out of CDA by also showing what this mode looks like. So here are the variant time series, and they're normalized. So the variance difference is not reflected in this time series. Instead, when you take these two time series, you get one for the slab ocean model and one for the fully coupled model. The slab ocean model is in blue and the fully coupled model variant is in red. You can regress these two time series onto surface temperature to get a spatial map of what the spatial characteristics look for, look as. Um, so essentially, this is what happens when you take the slab variant and regress it on a surface temperature. And it looks a lot like the NAO tribal pattern. You can do the same for the fully coupled model. And as you can see, the variance difference between the two models is reflected in the pattern. And in fact, the slab ocean model has four and a half times more variance than the fully coupled model in this mode because the discriminant ratio equals about four and a half. So why do we think that this is the NAO tripole pattern? So we regressed our variant time series onto the atmospheric variables of sea level pressure to investigate the atmospheric forcing associated with this mode. So the plots below just correspond with the plot above for the same model. So as you can see, the sea level pressure anomalies associated with this mode 
resemble the NAO. And what's plotted in black here is the mean sea level pressure in both models. Um, so the sea level pressure signature is relatively identical, but it appears that the response, the SST response to the sea level pressure is what differs between the two models. And in fact, the slab ocean model has a stronger SST response to the NAO than the fully coupled model. So now we move on to look at the second mode that has more variance in the slab ocean model. And this is what the variate time series of this mode looks like. And then we take this time series, regress it on a surface temperature, and we get a horseshoe-like SST anomaly. And this horseshoe-like SST anomaly has about three and a half times more variance in the slab ocean model than the fully coupled model. It looks remarkably similar to the AMV, and that caused us to investigate the relationship of this mode to the AMV. So we quantified the AMV index in the fully coupled model and slab ocean model as the regionally average Atlantic SST from zero to 60 North and overplotted that with our variant. So you could see for the slab ocean model variant and the slab ocean model AMV, there's a high correlation at about 0.86. And it's pretty convincing that what is being picked out by CDA is the AMV. The fully coupled model and fully coupled model AMV are pretty highly correlated as well, but not as strongly correlated as in the slab ocean model. So this suggests that the A and B has more variance in the slab ocean model. Um, moving on. So now we're gonna explore which SST patterns have more variance in the fully coupled model. So we're gonna look at the modes down here. So the first component with more variance in the fully coupled model um, has a varied time series that looks like this. We regress it on the surface temperature and we get an equatorial SST anomaly that has about five times more variance than the fully coupled model. So this to me looked a lot like Atlantic Nino. So we investigated the relationship of this mode to Atlantic Nino. And here, same deal as the AMV, we have the Atlantic Nino index over plotted of our fully coupled model SST variant. Vari and there's also a high correlation. So it's pretty convincing that this mode is actually the Atlantic Nino. And this is actually really reassuring because the Atlantic Nino is a mode that's known to be related to ocean dynamics. So CDA is given no information about what patterns to look for or temporal information, anything like that. It's just given the raw SST fields. So the fact that the Atlantic Nino comes out as the leading mode with more variance in the fully coupled model is pretty promising and tells us that CDA is able to isolate modes that we know and love without having any pre preconceived information about those modes. Thanks. Um, so now I'm going to move on and talk about the component with more variance in the fully coupled model. And um, essentially, it's a subpolar SST anomaly. And um, this is promising, too, because we know that the subpolar SST is related to ocean dynamics. Um, this SST anomaly is strongly related to sea surface height anomaly over the North Atlantic current. But I really want to get to my next slide because this is when I'm going to start talking about the AMOC. Um, so we were wondering if this mode was related to the AMOC. And there is an AMOC signature associated with the subpolar SST anomaly. As you can see, there is some anomaly in the warming hole region, and we thought that the AMOC could be important here. The AMOC signature does occur over the same latitude band, but the signature is relatively weak um, compared to the annual mean AMOC strength. So in order to investigate this further, um, essentially, I took the fully coupled model and I computed 30 EOFs of the AMOC. And I regressed those 30 EOFs of the AMOC in the fully coupled model out of the fully coupled model SST. And then I computed CDA between the fully coupled model with AMOC regressed out and the fully coupled model with AMOC still in it. And through this analysis, I found that there was no significant change in SST after removing the AMOC. So what's shown here are the discriminant ratios after um, by computing CDA between the fully coupled model with AMOC removed and the fully coupled model with AMOC in. And the pink line is the null hypothesis and the black line is our samples. So this is showing that our results of removing the AMOC caused no significant change in SST variability, not only for the subpolar modes, but for any mode of SST variability. 
And these are my conclusions. I'll just leave them up because I know that I'm running short on time and my contact information is down here. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Any questions? I think there were two online questions. Oh, they were clapping. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I can't see the chat <laughs> from in here. There is one online. Who is it, Sam? I'm going to stop. There's a question from Yavor Kostov. Hold on. Hi. Hi, Olivia. Um, hey. Uh, great, great talk. Um, I also heard it at Ocean Sciences, uh, and it was equally interesting. But uh, I didn't ask you back then. I was wondering if uh, the lack of connection with the AMOC could be because you're looking at, at the AMOC in depth space. Um, and could you comment on the possibility that maybe there is a connection to the AMOC in density space? say the the water mass transformation across the uh, OSAP east line for example yeah i think that that's definitely possible the eofs that i computed were in depth space and i know that the amoc is noted to be stronger in density coordinates so it would be interesting to redo the analysis in density coordinates and see if i get a different answer um, but that's a great point and i definitely think that it's possible that the AMOC could be important if I computed it in density space. I also want to point out that this is only for one model. Um, so it would be interesting to do this in a multi-model experiment and see if the same results are had. Great, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. We have a room in or a question in the room from Gokhan. Yeah. So I, I was wondering how you are differentiating the time scale of these patterns. You seem to be just uh, mat trying to match the spatial structures of the patterns, but if AMV is going to be a mode, a variability, a signature, then uh, are you essentially looking at its time scale with your analysis? So my analysis looks at monthly time scales, but you can also do this analysis okay at a low frequency. So Rob Wills has done this analysis at low frequency. Um, another analysis that I've done that's not included in this presentation was I computed annual means and I did this analysis. And what was interesting about that was when I basically used the longer timescale data, it appears that the NAO mode and the AMV mode blend together and they're not as distinctly separated as when you use the monthly data. So I definitely think that the results of this analysis would depend on what timescale you choose to look at. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there and places to explore. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Olivia? All right, I think we should open up this to the discussion. Claudia, do you want to kick us off for the discussion? Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a few questions we thought would be, and one was uh, posed like, how close is AMOC to a tipping point? Uh, we already talked about it a little bit yesterday and the day before. Um, so do we have enough measuring accuracy of AMOC right now to know when we are reaching the tipping point? Uh, can we tell when we reach the tipping point from the observational time series we have right now? Gokhan's looking at Wilbert right now. Do you want to answer, Wilbert? Do you want to attempt to answer? Do you want to make a comment? I'll hand it back to Gok. Mike Paul. So I'm going to ask a question maybe of Wilbur and Gokhan. What would you need to observe to conclude whether or not we are near a tipping point? Regardless of when you can do, I'm not asking if you can say that now, but what would you need? 
Well, I think the, the, the critical ingredient of the, the hysteresis basically the, the, is the satisfaction feedback. So I think if we start observing a reduction in a northward heat transport into the, the Nordic seas, that's probably where we need to get worried. So that might be a, one of the most critical things that we should be observing, maybe. Going to say I don't know, but I'm not. I mean, I, with, in a coupled system, also uh, the, the salt advection feedback is mostly coming from simplified modeling frameworks, two box models or four box models. So in a coupled system, there are so many other feedbacks going on. So I, I really don't know what we need to observe to make uh, to give a definite uh, answer about shutting off or tipping point. I think there's no evidence that the shallow overturning can turn off. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I would be curious to know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if you look at the shallow overturning that's taking place during the last glacial maximum uh, <clears throat> that uh, Bill Curry and Delia Opal show so nicely, wh what is the strength of the AMOC necessary to maintain that pattern? Uh, can you get away with just one or two sphere drips, or do you need at least five or six or ten sphere drips to keep that pattern alive from getting diffused or lost? <clears throat> I don't know. But I do agree with uh, uh, Will that uh, as far as the sudden, sh uh, especially the sudden turn-ons, I'm not aware that we can have a sudden turn-off. We can go in gradually into slowdowns and collapse. But the, the downscored rescue events and the downs and uh, going into the bully and <clears throat> the younger dryers, these are gradual processes, maybe stepwise, but they're gradual, and then you have a collapse. Uh, the, there's a striking asymmetry, so you can have very rapid rises. But uh, so my notion is that, as I've said before, that the Nordic seas can turn off, but the but the but the shallow overturning cannot turn off. But how low it can go, I don't know. Is that okay? I think this the um, shallow overturning turned off during Heinrich events, right? It... Correct. It might not be in equilibrium. That, that's possible, but it'd be just very temporary. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know how well accepted it is whether there was a shutdown or slowdown even during Heinrich events. A little bit controversial, but I think there's still quite a lot of debate about how to interpret the proxy evidence. I think the community's moved away from there being a shutdown during Heinrich events. I no, I don't think anyone really thinks that anymore. Um, but there's emerging emerging views that actually there may not have been that substantial a week, that substantial weakening. So it, it's I think it's still very much being debated. There's still a lot of proxy work to do. Excuse me. Let, let me second that. Uh, the, um, I mean, during the glacier maximum, we had a Gulf Stream that was going straight across the ocean. So we had a whopping big subpolar gyre at that time. And to shut, even if it was a lot of ice covered there, expect the whole thing to be covered with ice to the point where you don't have convection to some depth. That, that strikes me as asking an awful lot. Is that, accurate? Is that what you're kind of implying? Yeah, I mean, I think from a model perspective, there's a, um, a whole range of different responses. They can have a stronger or a weaker AMOC. We really don't have good constraints. Uh, the proxy evidence would I guess on balance suggest a slightly weaker AMOC during the last glacial, and most of the proxies do suggest a weakening during the Heinrich event. But there's sort of some proxy data that may be suggesting that weakening isn't as pronounced as we used to think. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunately uncertain at the moment.
So if it's unlikely that to happen, then uh, what can we tell from changes in AMOC and other time scales, not necessarily paleo, paleo climate scales? David Sonali again. I mean, I guess um, we're falling into the trap again of just talking about AMOC as a single thing and AMOC strength being a really key parameter. But what we do know happened in the glacial period, there was abrupt climate change. And it doesn't necessarily mean that AMOC strength needed to alter, but there's different ways that AMOC can operate. And so obviously you can change where the deep water is forming and that has big consequences for northward heat transport in the different locations. So you, could, you can still have abrupt climate changes even if we keep AMOC constant, it's just changing the patterns of circulation. You know, I think that's been a long running debate even back in the 80s, I think it was in the 90s, it was very much, is it about change in strength of AMOC or is it about change in depth and location, northward penetration of AMOC? So we need to be careful not to talk too much or focus too much on just AMOC strength, but there's various patterns of it. We have an online comment. From Ronellis. Yeah, I was just um, thinking about maybe there are key locations where we should be observing, looking for changing, uh, you know, volume transports or salt transports or heat transports and th places where we have long term observations already, like the Florida Straits or, um, you know, some of the places that we've heard about um, during the meeting this week. So just throwing that out there. Yeah, this, this is Chris Pankush from Hui. I would second what Vanellis just said. Um, you know, the result I showed really doesn't, it's really not definitive in terms of temperature transport. I mean, you can make an assumption and use the trend I computed to get a V prime T bar type term. But, but what I've done, you know, I don't really know anything about how temperatures changed in the straight. So I don't know about sort of a V prime T prime or a V bar T prime type, type thing. So I think one shouldn't jump. Renellis wasn't doing this. I'm just sort of giving this giving this caveat that you can't really jump from my conclusion to making a really definitive statement about what temperature transport did. I think it's a great place to look. Yeah, and so if if the AMOC structure is so important, then uh, having a essentially boundary western boundary eastern boundary type array to measure AMOC strengths that wouldn't give us the heat transports or the structure. So. I mean, so this is Chris again from who, I mean, what do we, I mean, I know that, for example, rapid and other arrays will put out heat flux products, but is there room, you know, if we're ultimately interested in more climatically relevant fluxes, not just volume or mass, um, how different would our observing systems need to be? Or can, how would we leverage Things like Argo, you know, what, what are the prospects there? I really don't know because I don't know how to observe anything. Presumably, like Claudia said, you couldn't do it with just boundary arrays. Yeah, I, I was just thinking of back to the work um, that I think Zoli, Zoli did a while back looking at temperature and salinity transports. And so I, I don't know how they've changed over time, but that, that's sort of the thought process that was going on in my head. And then, um, you know, I, I didn't get to ask Chris the question about whether uh, tide gauge data would be a longer time series for which we could look at the the sea level differential across the Florida Straits, and if that provides a longer term look at the trends. Yeah, so you can do that. Um, I didn't do that here because I was really interested in getting the high frequency daily signals and producing a 40 year daily product was computationally onerous. Trying to get something going back even further would be even more so, but I've, I have published an annually resolved reconstruction using tide gauges and that can get you back um, beginning of the 20th century, it's a lot more uncertain. You know, I couldn't put the kind of confidence limits that I did here. It's, it's, it's much less certain. Um, but yeah, in principle, that's an informative data source. Um, and in principle could be 
straightforwardly fold it into something like I, I did today. I just, I just didn't. Hi, this is Yao. Um, I have a maybe naive question. So um, as Chris showed that uh, the Gulfstream has weakened for um, one point something sort of drop. And uh, Tom Rosby also showed that in the past 100 years, the AMARC has weakened by 2.5 sort of drop. But we know that AMARC and uh, Western boundary current is very, very highly, uh, high, highly variable. So does it really matter <laughs> that one point or two point something change to uh, the climate or whatever. Is that to me? <laughs> Generally, yes. <laughs> okay, well, you're asking two different questions, right? You're saying, given a magnitude of decline, is it climatically relevant? But I kind of heard another question embedded in there, which is, how small of a trend can you detect, right? And so that, I mean, in my talk, I mean, the latter question, I mean, I'm confident that my error bars are meaningful because I've chosen a, a null noise model that I think, again, GE box is instructive here. All models are wrong, right? Um, but I, I do think that I've reasonably, you know, described the structure and the data. So I, I do think you can, you, can, you can detect these small, subtle trends. I'll give an answer on that one. But does it matter? I mean, you have to realize that it's not the heat flux that matters, but the time integral heat flux that matters. So maybe it's a subtle transport change, but if it's maintained for long periods of time, that's going to matter. No, I, was, I was just saying it matters for sea level. And that's, that has climate relevance. And yeah, I do think it matters, but what matters also is, you know, the divergence of heat between different latitudes, right? So I think um, just like what Chris showed today, we need to make an effort from the observational point of, you know, side of things to actually analyze our time series a little bit more carefully, taking care of the uncertainties and trying to come up with, um, you know, diagnostics about the variance, the trends, finding the, the right statistical model that could be applied to a time series at different latitudes, and then we can come up with, um, you know, um, conclusions about how it has been changing and if it matters and how comparable it is to the other time series that we get from the paleo climate records, as well as, um, you know, from the models. Um, that was Shannon Lipo from the University of Miami. I guess I was just going to, uh, sorry, Dan, I'm Ryan from NCAR. Yeah, following up on Shane's comment about the paleo. Um, are these trends also? I guess there's an attribution step that maybe is, seems a little implicit in this conversation, but you know, it's just a variability on long time scales. All right, thank you. Uh, this is Gail Forge from MIT. Um, so I guess just a couple of comments or questions related to this. Uh, we have a paper last year with um, uh, Louise Rousselet, the person who really read, um, did the computations and, and Paul HSE where we did kind of a with the 20 year average we have from ECHO, we did a 8,000 year Lagrangian simulation to kind of quantify the way that, um, you know, the mark, the global mark uh, goes back to a latitude that we chose at 11 south. I'm bringing this up because one of the conclusions of the paper is that the, um, we get a computation of the import of salinity towards the Atlantic, which I think has bearings to the equation of the stability. And in relation to the comment that was made before, um, I've, I'm always kind of nervous about the fact that we don't have a good handle from an observational perspective on evaporation in particular, but turbulent um, air sea fluxes in general. Um, I think maybe there is a role to play um, for having more measurements of that on moorings across the Atlantic. Just um, some thought.
don't see anything in the room right now. No hands are raised. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then tying into the, um, can we detect a massive change? I mean, there's always the issue with how do we prioritize the observations? How many latitudes do we need? How much density in the zonal do we need to detect some kind of a transition in the AMOC system, not in the AMOC integrated transport? So uh, if we want to monitor if it starts shutting down in higher latitudes, that's one thing. How much do we need to observe it then at lower latitudes or in the Southern Ocean or even in other oceans, not in the Atlantic, just the global system? This is Liz Maroon from Wisconsin, and perhaps this is a naive comment, but I haven't heard too much about altimetry, and I'm wondering that as a larger spatial view, is there some way of leveraging that into this kind of thoughts of, you know, seeing if something is about to abruptly change? Yeah, I actually also have a little bullet on that one. So if we like correlate altimetry measurements with in situ dynamic height, right now the correlations are pretty good, but if the system shifts, then those correlations could be non-stationary. And then what do we do? So talking about estimating velocity from altimetry, basically using dynamic height from in situ observations as a ground truth of what's going on in the ocean. So if we are in a glacial maximum, there would probably be a different relationship between dynamic height and sea surface height. A lot of encouragement for people to speak up in the room, but no one raising. <laughs> Chris, I see Chris has, you know, sacrificed himself. Go ahead. <laughs> talk. People know that. Um, oh, actually, no. Renella has a comment. I'll let her talk. <laughs> no, physic in person before virtual. Oh goodness. Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, so this is common got me thinking I, I think I think we yeah, need to be creative about these thoughts you know what would we look for um, a lot of our the things we talked about are obser observing the mean state of the system you know detecting some tipping point um, but, it, but again there's a whole literature which I'm totally unfamiliar with about you know looking at metrics for you know crossing thresholds and in in that literature from my very little understanding you know you worry about things like heteroscedastic behavior, you know, changes in the variance of a property or changing in the autocorrelation property. So um, does, does that inform what we want to, to measure if we're not just measuring or do we want to look not only to mean state parameters, but also things like the variance and the autocorrelation properties and whether those are changing with time? Totally unrelated to altimetry, but... Ronellis? So, so my comment is unrelated to altimetry, but it was related to the fact that we've been hearing that the behavior of the MOC is different amongst the different gyres. So I think, you know, we want to still continue, we, and that's what we are doing. I think we still want to continue measuring um, in different in different gyres as we cross from the tropics to the subtropics to the subpolar region. Maybe we want to be observing in the intergyres which I don't think we've talked about so much during this meeting, but I know in the past we'd talked about um, the interface between the subtropical North Atlantic and the subpolar North Atlantic. I don't know if, what, if people have thoughts about whether we should be observing somewhere that we aren't ob currently observing. So 
So I'm going to throw out a random idea because it's like 530. So and my brain gets a little fuzzy and creative at this tower. So in the, in the paleo record, how do we, how do we hypothesize that AMOC has changed? Well, we have multiple lines of evidence from all over the world in terms of global impacts of AMOC, things like ITCZ changes. So what about like making some sort of global index of all the things that AMOC influences and when they all go in the same direction, maybe that means something. I see a comment from Dan. We'll run the mic up to you real quick, real quick. No pressure, Sam. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Hallie, I think that's an interesting suggestion. I guess I've been thinking a little bit in terms of right metrics or I, I'm reminded of like the work that the climate sensitivity community has done. And, you know, of course, that's a humble single scaler and we're preoccupied with this high dimensional system. But, you know, they have the, a focus around that community, which is shrinking a probability density function around the sensitivity of, you know, global temperatures as uh, CO2 rise. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about if there are some values like that um, where we might be able to try to come up with orthogonal or complementary things and then to start to think about things analogous to um, emergent constraints and you know that sort of thing and then track our progress over time and if it's like that community you know sometimes it, sometimes the pdf doesn't shrink but it's interesting to think about these indices so we do have a question online from john robson um he doesn't want to wake up his family because it's much later there than it is here surprisingly um but the recent board's paper used the changes in variance of sst based amoc proxy but this index is very dependent on observation uncertainty. My question is, do you see similar in other paleo proxies? To be specific, observational uncertainty is the sense of how well constrained the interannual variance is. Hi, David Thornally. Uh, I guess there's uh, two parts to that. So John's talking about the change in variance, and there are a number of uh, proxy records that have suggested a change in variance over uh, the industrial era or increase in the 20th century. That in itself uh, wouldn't really tell you much, um, just because obviously you could, you've got increased external forcing uh, going on, and so that could have led to the variance. But as well, there's the um, Critical slowdown that the Bulls paper uses, the autocorrelation. Um, it's quite, uh, I mean, this is where the records that uh, Al Wanamaker does and Halley works on the annually uh, laminated records or annually banded records are particularly useful because you can do robust statistics on those. So uh, those, that would be a way forward to look into some of that. Um, we are working up some of these grain size records, tantalizingly the one we did in 2018. Uh, it shows very similar statistic, well, statistics um, to the Bohr's paper, which I found exciting, but it's not ready for prime time because we need to <laughs> do some checks, get more dating. So I'm like, I was quite skeptical of the Bohr's paper, you know, in terms of it, but it's, there's some surprising similarities. So uh, hold your breath. We'll see, we'll see. But I think we can, that's a, a nice place that um, paleo proxy data could contribute and especially doing these uh, annually banded records. You can do some really good stats on that, but it's a lot of work to develop those records. So give Al and Hallie lots of money. <laughs> okay, I looked it up on my computer. I remember this paper. Um, yeah, so um, I, I would say that I think we could make it a 10th with what we've got in terms of high resolution proxies. I think there's probably enough data to, to at least make an attempt and it would be interesting to see. There's a, a comment by Leon. To say something on AMOC weakening, we need to observe a coherent change in the Atlantic. I would expand on this, but my family are sleeping here as well. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Go, Gokhan wants to know what's more important, family or AMOC? Which he said <laughs> turtles are more important earlier than Gokhan. So. <laughs> I, I have a comment on Leo's comment, Leon's comment. Um, I think uh, I'm not sure that we need to observe a coherent change in Atlantic because I don't think the MOC is very coherent in the Atlantic. Uh, so I guess that's a general question. Um, how well, how well do we understand the three-dimensional structure of the mean AMOC, and then even more difficult than anything is the variability. My understanding from uh, what I remember of papers I've read is that there's very little coherence meridiano, meridionally in AMOC. So um, I, I think Leon's optimistic thinking that we might be able to observe a coherent change because I don't think we have that kind of coherence. All right, we have another comment from Hallie and Tom. We'll take Tom first, then Martha, then Hallie. I was wondering whether, uh, I mean, I, we were, Kathy and Jamie and I were a bit surprised at how well we picked out the AMOC uh, from just looking at the hydrography along the continental slope here and uh, <clears throat> referencing that to Bermuda and to East Africa. So I was starting to wonder whether this was a little bit along the lines of what Jean, uh, Jean uh, Stieglitz has done in the past, uh, but whether we could take this technique that we found ourselves doing and constructing potential energy or basically uh, uh, hydrographic profiles along the slope and in the past uh, through, through whatever uh, uh, paleo records we can construct for Bermuda and Africa as well. I mean, there's just three points. I mean, three localized areas. And that would give us the potential energy differences from which we can derive quite readily the AMOC in some integrated sense and the wind-driven system in some integrated sense. The weakness or what the assumption that we have to make is where is the maximum in the overturning? And uh, I don't know, if, if, the modeling if the modeling community could help us sort of constrain where that overturning might take place, then we can do is use the hydrography in some form or another down to that depth and get the maximum that way and hence, and hence uh, partition out the wind-driven part and the AMOC part. That's just a thought. Martha? So I, I also agree that the AMOC does not appear to be um, moderately coherent between the gyres on, on decadal timescales, which, you know, is, is, we haven't even observed the decadal timescales yet. But, um, you know, my, as somebody who's not part of the paleo community, I, I, my impression is that there's some assumptions in the paleo community that you are going to get on longer timescales, some sort of coherent variability, because without that, um, the sparse observations that we have would never be able to um, estimate the AMOC. I, I'm not convinced that the sparse observations that we have um, can estimate the AMOC. But if, if you look from like a data simulation point of view, it, you know, in, in the time period since 1992, when there's been observations, um, the, the various models, you know, imperfect as they are, um, with millions of observations put in them, do not agree on the decadal timescale changes of the AMOC. So, you know, you might ask, can, can the paleo data do that? Um, it, it, you know, if the, the coherence is similar to it is on the decadal timescale. If it's more coherent, then, then you know, maybe you can argue that, that it can, but we don't know the answers to that question, you know? So, I, I mean, it's a very hard problem, even for the observational period, right? What the AMOC has done. You know, so so I don't know what the answer is, but it's there's not a, a lot of data, you know, to answer it. I, I I want to call out that the questioning of whether or not 
we know AMOC in the past uh, from paleo data. I think there's there's a large literature of how much data we, do we need to see, and then there's a lot of theory and a, a lot of understanding that basically the bigger the change, the, the less data you need to see it. Um, I mean, just just as a, a as a basic example, and I'm not thoroughly thoroughly up on that literature enough to to um, to to go into detail, but an example would be just um, like Mike Mann's reconstructions of Northern Hemisphere temperature over the last thousand years. We don't need that many data points in order to reconstruct Northern Hemisphere temperature over that time scale. Um, I think I think the I think at some point there was an analysis that said we only need like 10 or 15 records because the change in the modern era was really big. So so that's. I'm not going to go deep into that, but I, I wanted my original reason for wanting the mic was to address Mike Spalk's comment of is is the meridional overturning coherent? And I, I, I totally agree with you. It's, you know, it's not on 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 interannual scales. Um, but I would also argue that the forcing that we are imposing right now is of geologic scale. This is no longer of human scale. Um, and so therefore we would expect the response potentially to be of geologic scale. And we know that millennial variability happens over a period of decades, the system switches. So that any switch that we might be causing anthropogenically could, I think is very likely to be a coherent switch because that's what we see. Um, happening in, in the past. Just to build on Holly's comment and kind of play devil's advocate to, to Martha's question, I was looking around to see if Nick Focal's still in the room, but he's not. He and I have had this conversation about how you, I mean, there have been a few papers published uh, on sort of the divergence of a lot of these data, assimila data assimilating ocean reanalyses that, you know, can be really all over the place. Um, but I'll just, you know, doesn't solve the problem, but I think it's important to keep in mind, I, I stressed this in my talk, that more data doesn't mean more certainty. The fact that we have these data assimilating models that are bringing in millions of data points um, and that they don't agree, that doesn't say that we can't solve a problem with less than a million data points. It just says what that might be saying is that you're bringing in too much structure into these models that can't accommodate it. You know, So like I said earlier, more data, more problems. Yeah, go ahead, go on. Yeah, I mean, we were just, just discussing that thing too. As we get, as we more, um, know more about AMOC, we are learning that we don't know much about AMOC. But uh, my question was just uh, sort of it. Um, Martha reminded me in one of the AMOC meetings, and it might be actually at the Paleo AMOC meeting in Boulder. So I recall a discussion of sort of uh, creating a project for Paleo data assimilation efforts. What is the has, what is the status of those efforts? Ken, okay. I can't comment completely on the scope of this, but you know, there's a lot of ongoing efforts in Europe, um, also in the U.S. Um, some of these have been using the MIT GCM and the adjoint capabilities. Um, so, you know, those have targeted AMOC in particular. I think the thing that's really taken off um, over the last 10 years or so is more ensemble-based methods, um, particularly focused on terrestrial records where there's annual resolution. Um, these tend to be offline approaches, so the model dynamics is brought in only indirectly through the covariances that you use. So it's, in a way, a sequence of least squares problems. Um, Anyway, I feel like it's a rapidly moving thing, and um, there's been a lot of developments, both on the DA side and then on this crucial aspect of how to model proxy records within um, models themselves. So this is development of proxy system models. Um, yeah, I, I also, I'll take this uh, moment to comment on Martha's question, which I think is a profound one. I think it also speaks to, you know, the, this question of, well, if there are just as many degrees of freedom on centennial timescales as there are on annual ones, then you know what good are the, the paleo data? And um, I think you know the, the question they're asking is ultimately like how much skill do we have in reconstructing internal variability from the paleo records? And I think that's something that we just have to study. 
And, you know, out of data assimilation comes not just reconstructions, but also estimates of those covariances themselves. So I think it's a powerful tool for assessing both the state and these questions of covariance. I just wanted to make a comment about some of the things we just uh, heard. Um, so this is Shanelli Pope from the University of Miami. And so maybe I do not understand what you're talking about, but when I hear things such as there is no meridional coherence of the MOC, uh, first of all, I mean, if there isn't, what's the point of observing it at one latitude, all right? So, so we expect by observing the MOC at one latitude that it's gonna have to do with the other latitude as well as the globe and the global climate, right? And then the meridional coherence is a function of time scale, right? So that's another component. So I do hope that on paleoclimate time scales that there is a meridional coherence, otherwise what is the point of like, you know, determining, determining what the MOC is from just one core in one portion of the North Atlantic? Right, and and you know, sorry, but also about almost ten years ago, I did publish some limited evidence that there is meridional coherence in the observations as well. Right, so sure, wind-driven. So the observational evidence of meridional coherence from you know the buoyancy force emoci is a little bit more elusive, that's for sure. But from the wind-driven component, which also you know has a thermal component, is is definitely in the observation. Yeah, I think, I think we can say pretty confidently when we look at millennial changes in the paleo record, there is pretty good coherence. I mean, we can track the changes. They're obviously always proxies, but we can look at the changes in Greenland. We can then look at the strength of the overflows. We can then look at the strength of the deep western boundary current. Obviously, these aren't full AMOC, but we can then move down to off um, the coast of South America. We can see those same changes. We can look at the uh, influx of North Atlantic deep water uh, and then we can see the, in the uh, Cape Basin, and then we can see the change in Antarctica. And we saw earlier, we can look at the phase uh, lag, and we can see there's a 100, 200-year lag between what's happening in the north and the south. We, I can push back pretty strongly. We know the AMOC behaves coherently on millennial timescales. We also know it probably from observations. If you look at um, geochemical traces in the ocean, the whole reason we have the idea of a conveyor was all the work that um, Wally Broker and others did back in the 70s. And those tracers show that it's this conveyor circulation. When Susan's given talks in the past, she stressed, we see that conveyor circulation on these very long time scales, but we just don't know where it breaks down. And we don't know on, say, centenius, on a 100-year time scale, is there that coherence or not? And that's the interesting thing for now. So I think we've got quite a lot of confidence from the paleo records that it behaves coherently on those time scales. Maybe I should clarify what I meant by coherence. I'm, I'm not talking, obviously, on very long time scales. Mass is conserved. It's a global circulation. I'm, I don't think that's a, a yeah. controversial. And extreme events, if you're shutting off about the same kind of thing. I was referring more to what I think the theme of this afternoon session was, was state estimates. So I'm kind of thinking of modern AMOC um, observational record, the modern observational record, and can we track variability in a coherent way? And I think that's going to be difficult. Hi, um, this is Yao again. So I think we don't really need to go to the uh, paleo record to see the coherence of the ocean or the, the AMOC. So I think 100 years ago, during the um, uh, British Discover um, cruise or the German medical cruise, they have measured uh, meridionally, meridionally through the entire Atlantic Ocean. You see the salinity signal all the way from south to north, and you see the coherence already, I think. So that's definitely a signal of a long-term coherence of AMOC. It's just a question, do we observe um, a coherent AMOC on different timescales, I think? We have two minutes left. Oh. Yep, so Mike, small request I read some of the comments. Um, I think most recently Martha Buckley said, 
Paleo data may be able to see AMOC changes if they are large and large scale. If they are small and not coherent, then they will not. And there are some people in the room that agree. Um, Claudia then said, Florida Straits agreed, plus there are likely to be changes in the properties on the way through the Gulf of Mexico. Not sure by how much, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I mean, that was a long back and forth between Ronellas and Zoli, and I just gave my five cents. And then right, another comment. Robson. Yeah, another comment from John Robson. I guess one worry is that even if a large scale weakening happened in a few decades, we wouldn't ideally be sure if it was happening straight away. Although maybe that wouldn't be relevant. I'm thinking here about when Rapid had the large decline of uh, five sphere jobs a decade, which wasn't a collapse in the end, we think. Uh, yeah. yeah, I guess I'll just make an esoteric comment that we, you know, we observe the deep western boundary current at multiple latitudes, even though we know it breaks up into eddies along the way as it's moving from the north to the south. And because we're tracking thing, it does important things and it carries North Atlantic deep water and we studied them, even though it might not be coherent in some places uh, to behavior further upstream, this doesn't mean it's not telling us important information. I see it's six o'clock. Any last comments? Claudia, do you have anything? Uh, no last comment, no. I think this was a good discussion. Agreed. There are people here that are starting to clap. There we go. <laughs>